Professor Maritus Landscape Architect Dr. Ismawi Haji Zain from Department of Landscape Architecture Kuya of Architecture and Environmental Design IIUM. And we also have architect Dr. Masto Surat is coming soon from the Architecture Department Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, University, National University of Malaysia UKM. And uh, we're going to have another prominent speaker this afternoon who is Professor Dr. Muhammad Zaini bin Othman from the Center for Advanced Studies on Islam, Science and Civilization, UTM, Kuala Lumpur. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, yang berbahagia Dr. Muhammad Yazid Muhammad Yunus, uh, leader for two brands, is uh, TRGS on Islamic City Planning and also IPB Putra uh, on Islamic City Planning also. And uh, the leader for Culture and Heritage Research Group, Dr. Associate Professor Dr. Nankula Utaberta and groups of uh, the important groups, a uh, group members of Culture Heritage Research Group, Dr. Sumarni Ismail, Dr. Sumarni, okay, he's still outside, she's still outside, and also myself, uh, for your information, this event today is organized by Culture and Heritage Research Group, Faculty of Design and Architecture, University Putra, Malaysia. So above all, today's event is very meaningful because we are not only having prominent speakers, we also have our beautiful guests from the University National Islam Malang. We have, uh, may I introduce our friends from university, we have Ibu Erna, we have Ibu Aulia from Architecture Department, we have Ibu Prima, and we also have pa Farid. Yeah, and please give a big of applause to all the prominent guests to faculty this morning. And also for the students from Culture and Heritage Research Group, students from, third year students from Department of Architecture, welcome to the seminar of the day. All right? So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, this seminar is, is held basically for the research group to gain and to learn as many as possible knowledge from our prominent speakers and their willingness to come here today to join us to share the experience which is very meaningful and in fact we cannot we may not be able to to basically provide them with money because what they do want to give to us today is actually worth more than money worth more than anything else thank you very much prof touch thank you very much prof mawi thank you very much architect master so have you seen architect master can we have architect master to stand up so wait for his uh, uh, his talk this afternoon, yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we hope that we can really learn from them. And for your information, life is about a circle. So Prof Tajudin, Prof Mawi, they are basically our sifu, our teacher. Back in during our school study, and they know they have been seeing us grow up until now. And Prof Taj just asking me, how many children do you have? Because when he used to know me, I'm still single. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but not anymore now. So that's going to be happening to all of uh, the students. Things will you are going to be seeing your lecturers, your friends, and for that reason, keep a very good relationship with them. Not only because of their knowledge but because they are so meaningful in your life and they definitely have done something to let us, their students, to grow until this stage. Thank you very much. We are obligated to both of you, to all of you, until the end of our day. Alhamdulillah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I wish to invite um, Dr. Mama Yazid Mama Yunus to come forward to give a few words and to explain a little bit on our research grants and our research projects that we are doing now. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and very good morning. Uh, thanks to Prof. Ismail Zain, Prof. Tanjudin, Prof. Uh, Akintek Mastol and all, all my friends here. So thanks uh, Dr. Naltia. Actually today is, uh, as mentioned Dr. Naltia, just we have two uh, very um, good speakers there. We are, uh, actually want to uh, get some information about the Islamic city planning. So then after this, um, our students, some uh, research assistant, our GRA, they will collaborate and then we can um, formulate some proposal for, um, 
framework for Islamic city planning. Then after that, the some stages of the research will be um, we'll progress in terms in term of the um, validity of the framework and also some the some some proposal of the model. So basically, today just uh, we get want to input get input from this all our expert. What actually the the whole about the whole about the Islamic city planning? Then we have to our group want to formulate some uh, new formulating a new concept contemporary concept in Malaysia about the how the successful the sustainability the, the path of the Islamic city planning. But it's quite I think quite a big issue. Then from the speaker that we get some ideas actually that the what's really the issue and then how from that from our no less today that we have to formulate some accurate, the precise, exactly according to the situation. And then the research will will be end on next year. Then we will propose some some framework of the Malaysian uh, in terms of the the best of the Islamic city planning, in terms of the heritage, in terms of the, our culture, in terms of the, the situation that now. But now we just get the input because for the time being, we just blur, not blur, just something that some assumption. So due to this, uh, and after the today, for our speakers, in terms of their expert, now probably we get some some ideas how actually that we have to narrow down the research framework, the research uh, we have to undergo the research till and yes, next year, uh, till uh, next year. So actually today, just uh, just just something get idea actually that we have the some brainstorming from these our speakers. They actually, what actually is the best way, the situation, the exactly current issue you want to know. That inshallah by next year actually that um, we have to finalize what the best of the framework that we have to propose in Malaysia. I think that's the thing about this, this general about the, our research. So that research will be it's about two years until starting the end of the Feb February and the end of the next uh, 2016 uh, December. Hope we can, I think, um, by our event today actually give you some, a lot of the, some knowledge available to us and also to some of our students. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mama Yazid. So, are we ready? Yes. All right. So, let's now start. Uh, may I invite Professor Dr. Muhammad Tajuddin Haji Muhammad Rashidi to come forward. Uh, and also, Professor Maritas Landscape Architect Dr. Ismawi Haji Zain to come forward. Oh, you want to sit? So, you prefer to sit? Okay, all right. So, never mind. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and, and the moderator for this session will be Dr. Nangkula Utaberta. And uh, without further ado, we will start with our first speaker, <coughs> Professor Dr. Muhammad Tajuddin Haji Muhammad Rashdi from the Faculty of Engineering, Technology and Built Environment, USSR University, Kuala Lumpur, with his title, Understanding Democratic and Human Values in Islamic City Planning, Vision for Malaysia. Professor Dr. Muhammad Tajuddin Haji Muhammad Rashdin. Another one big round of applause to Professor Dr. Taj. Okay, um, so I believe myself and all of our members in the hall, we are very inspired with the talk by Prof. Tajuddin. You have changed the view, the vision of being us seeing our physical environment. And I'm so happy being a landscape architect, Dr. Tash reinforced the importance of architecture and landscape architecture to live together, to work together and bind ourselves in order to go for a holistic design and planning of the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you so much, Dr. Tash, for your sharing. We thank you so much and we adore you for your philosophy and your principles in designing architecture design. And uh, as always, we will adore you and you'll always be our inspiration. Thank you, Dr. Taj. And we would like now to proceed with our second speaker, Professor Emeritus Landscape Architect Dr. Ismawi Haji Zain from the Department of Landscape Architecture, Kulia of Architecture and Environmental Design, IIUM Kuala Lumpur. And he'll be talking about vision on an Islamic city. Another interesting topic for you, so please be with us. Taste it, pin 
yourself on your chair and enjoy. Thank you very much. Dr. Promawi, the floor is yours. So our both professors, they have their uh, so-called um, sweet names. Yeah? So Professor Dr. Taj, today we call him Professor Dr. Taj. The only one in the world. And Prof. Mawi, uh, he's uh, quite a celebrity. So we call him Professor Dr. Mawi. Yeah? So <laughs> that's how we tend to get closer to each other. Yeah? So now he's ready. Uh, Dr. Prof. Mawi, belum lagi? Okay. Where, where is it now? So while we uh, while Prof Mawi is getting ready, why don't uh, members of the floor do you mind to write down all the questions? So any things that you would like to debate? Because in this hall we are debating, we are discussing, and we are open with thousands and millions of ideas. So I wish for you to start to write down all the questions because we're going to have our question and answer session, which is after uh, Prof Mawi's presentation, right? Yes, sorry. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the group for inviting me and also my other colleagues. And it is indeed a circle because we are all in this together at one time or another. And um, today I'm quite happy to be talking uh, to develop further the ideas that I have had for what I term as the idea of Islamic architecture. But I will promise you definitely that uh, I will not be talking along the lines that is usually being talked about. Usually when people talk about Islamic city planning or Islamic architecture, they come from what is called an object-centered discourse. <laughs> Uh, but I come from a value-centered discourse, and uh, I think this is a bit uh, different than, than the others. So I call the talk, uh, Democracy, Humanism, and the Eight Reminders in Muslim Life. Lessons for Design of Cities and Buildings. The Eight Reminders is actually, what is it as a Muslim, uh, as, an, as an individual, how I remind myself being a Muslim, and from this, we can actually build cities and also buildings. In fact, in architecture and city planning, planning it should start from there. Uh, but many of us want to use the quick way. Usually we use what we call typological studies. Although it is valid, but uh, we have to look at its restrictions. Now, in some mission, uh, in a summary, this is what uh, my, my life work has been is simply to get away from um, or to um, be understanding of uh, what is called the object-centered discourse and then to uh, put us into what is called a value-centered approach uh, because to my mind, Islamic architecture, the, the growth of the body of that knowledge did not develop uh, in the manner in which modernism uh, came about. Uh, if you are a student of modernism, you can see that it developed a certain way that it has evolved. But uh, Islamic architecture, the discourse, only started after the, uh, the evolution of these ideas uh, have come about, and therefore they have borrowed mainly from uh, the, uh, the discourses. Now, borrowing is okay. Uh, for instance, if you don't know how to be a Muslim, then you follow, say, uh, an individual, a ustaz, something like that. But it is very limited when you uh, encounter different things in life and, and, and so forth. Let's say you follow someone and uh, he's been with the Malay community, but then when you are in a non-Malay community, then there are things that uh, becomes a big problem. And so you cannot, therefore, use the typological model anymore. So that's why I say here the values of the Sunnah and sustainable design as anchors with technology and cultural dynamic as variable. So what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad and looking at how we learn from him. Now, 
I have made a study of uh, over 20,000 hadith from Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, Muwatta, and, and also the uh, historical uh, writing of uh, Sirah Ibn Hishar. And, and, and this is the actual YouTube of the Prophet's life. If you're going to click YouTube, you can watch almost anything nowadays. But if you want to YouTube the Prophet Muhammad, it is in this hadith. And I did that so that I could understand what Islam is. So when I studied that, then I look at there's so many implications, architecture, uh, planning, politics, society. And always uh, the opinion I have would be at odds with what with most of the established understanding of politics and society. Uh, because I come from directly from understanding the Prophet's life, not from some ustas or institution. Although that is also commendable, but we have to know its restriction. So in short, uh, tomorrow I'm talking uh, at PAM. I will elaborate this part more, but today I will not uh, do so. And just to say that if you look at this uh, discourse in revivalism uh, or structuralism, which is simply taking a form and putting in new structures, geometricism, as if Islam is the only religion that has geometry, which is something very, very strange. Um, and also making buildings in a geometrical form, and therefore that is Islamic. Or metaphor, Quran, and uh, palm trees, and, and things like that. Not to belittle them, but it has a limited discourse. Tomorrow I will talk more about this and, and going into the criticism of each of the discourse. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the summary of what I have in this slide, uh, if we use um, historical typology or a borrowed discourse, it's something to start with. But it is limited and it is very restricted. Because now we are in the modern world and in, East, in Malaysia we can see all the issue of our Allah issue and all these uh, other so-called controversial issues. We see that we are in a, 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 an area, an era of uh, new things and such typological approach cannot offer a good solution. I'm not saying that you cannot do this. Uh, build mosques with two minarets. In UTM, you have six minarets, you know. But uh, this is something that perhaps the research group have to also look at. Now, many people start by talking about what is in Islam, but I'm going to go over that. What is this Islam and what is in humanity? And this is something, a very controversial topic. It shouldn't be controversial, but apparently it is. So, uh, the thing that many people don't know is the, 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 these two points, morality and the clash of values. Now, this is something which no PhD student have, have, have looked at, that modern architecture started with a clash of values between Christian values and technology and function and politics and, and what you call natural sustainability. Frank Lloyd Wright was talking about sustainability way before people invented the word regionalism or green architecture. Okay, and um, August Dispugi uh, was one of those uh, very devout Christians who were talking about rationality and justification of ornaments and things like that. Now, tomorrow uh, at Recta, I'll go into that and I will show how this Christian value sparked off um, an interest in, in, in a new architecture. And then the political values of democracy, of socialism, of communism that govern this. This is the thing that we are very weak in. This is the thing that we have inherited the form of modern architecture, both in its building as well as its discourse. But we don't spend time to understand the political, social, cultural, and, 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 and religious uh, context of that time in Europe. And that's where we are lost. We are lost because we then only follow typologies. When we want to talk about Malaysian architecture, we go to the Malay house. When we talk, we don't ask the question, what is Malaysia is all about? And so when we talk about Islamic architecture, we go back to uh, so-called Middle Eastern cities, uh, although that is not wrong. As I said, it's 
good to start with. But uh, this is there. That's why I said that uh, Islamic architecture discourse did not uh, begin with the clash of values. And this is what I'm trying to have. So Islamic architecture must uh, be understood fully the historical context of modernism and to initiate its own clash of values. This is the, the thing that I will elaborate. Not today, but tomorrow as I said, but here I'm giving you the, the end product of it. Now, in order to, uh, to come up with the idea of what is so-called Islamic city planning and architecture, then we have to reconstruct the foundation of it. And the foundation, uh, we have to look at who we are as a people, eh? who we are as a society, who we are as a community. And I'm proposing uh, this uh, idea of uh, looking at Islam and the idea of civilization and of a civilized people. And I said in my writings that uh, I, as a Muslim, I am inclusive, meaning I, I, I see the goodness in all, in other religions, in Buddhism, in Christianity, in Hinduism, in democracy, in socialism, the goodness. But there are people who say, look, once you have embraced Islam, you have to forget about all this. Because these, these other things are all kachau or such. You know, well, if possible, we don't want them at all. I have found many attitudes like that. Many attitudes. To me, when I read the Quran and read the Hadith, uh, it is something that allows me to immerse myself in the, in the greatness of human, human civilization. Okay? Because the God that we know in the Quran, as I know it, is the God that is encompassing of all. But other people say, no, this God is different than that God. And then uh, you do not know the problem of the definition of God unless you read Karen Armstrong. Say, how can you express God in words? Eh? Well, God is not like humans, but you have to use human words and human experience. Yes, we can understand it, but only a little bit. And then you closed it and say other gods are no longer Islam. And so there is a, a problem there. So Islam and the idea of democracy and the imagined nation. Okay. Now when we talk about nationalism or national identity, we have to talk about a term called imagined community. My, my readings now is not on architecture. I'm reading about the formation of Malaysia, what are the, uh, the, the, the discourses about uh, the, what is Malayu and what is Malaysia and, and, and all this. This is my reading nowadays. It's not, no longer about architecture. Because if I'm to define a Malaysian architecture, and then we have to answer the first and foremost question, what is Malaysian all about? Uh, the idea of an imagined nation, you can be Malay and suddenly I'm born and somebody says you are Malayu. Although my family came from Patani 150 years ago, and uh, we are not known as Pendatang. And, but uh, this is when you are uh, in Malaysia, a Malaysian, that is the imagined community. You are Malay, you are Chinese, you are Hin Indian, you are Kadasan. But then when you are Malaysia, this is called the imagined community. And what is it? And this is the, 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 the problem uh, that we have to understand and in the universities as well as in the schools, it is not dealt with. And then we wonder why we have all this problem of racism and extremism and all that. We simply don't know. We are all Malays, Chinese, Indians, Kadazan living in a country called Malaysia, which is defined, uh, defined uh, geopolitically, that's all. But we don't have the heart or the imagined community. Okay? So in Islam, uh, I wonder one question perhaps maybe Dr. Ismawi or some Islamic scholar can answer. When were Muslims considered Muslims and when were they Islam considered Islam? Because when Islam came with the Prophet, he didn't say this is Islam. It, the, the word is not, it wasn't there. Okay? You must understand that. It was just being good, and before that, there were also being people who were doing good. But then something went on, people began to put layers of culture, layers of politics, layers of this, and then you have to peel it off and say, look, 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 we have to do good, okay? Believe in God and do good, give charity, help others. There's no name of Islam, it's just being good. 
Khatoli in his book says that once people start to divide themselves and call themselves Muslims, Islam, Christians, then the problem of humanity becomes because you compartmentalize things. You identify with your ego of your communities and that is the problem. In fact, it is okay to be called Islam and to be praying and to be wearing the tudung. But don't say, look, I'm better than you. I'm better than everybody else. Everybody else who is not like me is going to go to hell. I don't know where you pick that up. But uh, this is the problem, as I said, when you study such religion from institutions, but not going on a self-examination uh, uh, from the direct to the sources, which is the, 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 the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And Islam and the idea of universal humanistic spirituality, uh, do, we, do we have that? And I, I, I think we do. But many people say, no, Islam is Islam. Universal humanistic spirituality is nothing to do with Islam. So before we uh, go into the discussion about uh, what a Muslim life is, uh, let's look what is civiliza a civilized society. Now, I'm not a scholar in uh, social science and, and philosophy. And I only know uh, from my experiences, and, and I put up this thing, uh, a civilized society is a society of individuals, communities, and citizens who respect one another's differences and resolve racial, political, and cultural conflict through rational and well-mannered discourse. Now, let us ask this question. Is Islam in this? Is Islam civilized? I know some people don't like the definition of Westerners, uh, of civilization, and you must use Islam. Yeah, but, but I think Islam respects one another's differences from what I understand the Prophet's life, and I can show you from the Hadith. So Islam is civilized, and we can have a civilized discourse. Why is it that Islam never participated very well in interfaith discussion? Okay. Uh, so this is something funny, and I'm going to say something quite interesting uh, a bit later about um, uh, uh, S. N. Goenka. Okay, a civilized society is one in which no member of that society shall suffer from a one of the basic necessity of life and dignified existence. Basic shelter, basic housing, basic food. You don't, you know, if you are civilized, then, then people shouldn't be begging to buy a house, to get a house, and things like that. I mean, the issue now, housing. How can it become like that? When somebody asked me, um, what, how do we solve the problem of housing? I said, when I was in the UK, I lived in council houses. If that government can pro provide for the poor like me, why is it that we cannot provide for our general populace? Like that. Council houses. Yes, we did want DBKL, have their DBKL flats and all that, but then suddenly everything disappeared. Everything diswastaka and all that. So that is not Islamic, but this is a civilized idea. A civilized society is one that affords freedom of individuals to aspire creatively through technology without undermining the economic and moralistic well being of others. Now we have a problem. When I want to be creative, let's say I'm trying to create a story about time travel, about, uh, say, reincarnation. I'm thinking of several novels now, but that's another part of my life, I'm trying to think of writing novels now. After 50 books on architecture, Chukura, right? So now we want to write novels about, about saying something about society. But we have a problem. A certain group of people who calls themselves uh, Department of Religious Affairs say, no, you cannot do this. You cannot have this because this is not in Islam. Uh, you have a very small knowledge. The whole totality of human knowledge is nothing but a drop in an ocean. Okay? We must admit that. If we don't admit that, then we are not humble. If we are not humble, then we will never accept other people's opinion and views. Well, this is a, a problem when it comes to um, a restricted idea of Islam. Now, we look at the statement by uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Farouk Musa, in, in talking about Islamic politics instead of, uh, instead of uh, uh, endless discussion over the ideal Islamic state and its system, like Islamic economy. Uh, we should focus on fundamentals of civil state, such as justice, 
freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, good governance, separation of power, rule of law, respect for human rights and economic equality. So we're not saying all these others are not made. But when you have a problem of, let's say again, Islamic state, Islamic economy, Islamic city planning, Islamic this and Islamic that, though the gesture is nice, but you trap yourself once you use the term because your understanding of the term is limited. Okay? Um, people cannot be arrogant enough to say, I know everything. I don't know everything. Okay? So, so this is the idea when, we, we, when, 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 when somebody like this says like this, then you say, oh, he's a, he's a liberal. Now liberal is a dirty word in Islam. Okay? He's progressive. Once progressive was very good. Now even moderate cannot be used. Okay, so uh, not sure what else to, to, to speak of. Okay, I think I'm all three moderate, progressive, liberal. There it goes, there it goes, then up to the window. Okay, so I uh, don't like to use those words, I never use it to myself. I thought this was the Islam that I was talking about from the Prophet, I never used those words. But other people label and brand and, and then take off. Okay. When you look at the hadith of this, the Prophet, um, he, he said that uh, Allah says, O son of Adam, I fell ill and you visited me not. He will say, O Lord, and how should I visit you when you are the Lord of the worlds? He will say, Did you not know that my servant so and so had fallen ill and you visited him not? Did you not know that had you witnessed him, would you have found me with him? So here he's talking about compassion. Compassion to another human being. Alright? Where you can look at this and if you are a good architect or a good planner, from there you could translate it into so many different planning principles. Okay? So here is a civilized religion, a civilized way of life. And that is how it says. Oh, son of Adam, I asked you for food and you fed me not. He would say, Oh Lord, and how should I feed you when you are Lord of the worlds? Did you not know that my servant? So here is about basic necessity of life. In my mind, somebody who is poor, somebody who doesn't have something to eat, somebody who does not have a place to sleep, can just go to a mosque and sleep there. Eh? Whether he is a Muslim or non-Muslim, or whether he is a penagi dada, drug addict, just go. That's to my mind, but not to the Malay mind. Oh, tak boleh. Kotor. Bukan orang Islam. In the early days of the Prophet, he has a place called the Sufa space. In the Sufa space, it is a space where people go there to sleep, to stay there. Okay? Temporarily or for a long time just to be with the Prophet or because you don't have anywhere else to stay. And you look at our 100 million ringgit mosque, whether that spirit is there. Now, that is about the mosque. Now, how about city planning? How about the idea of uh, uh, housing? How about certain other ways in which you could... Uh, so not only the mosque, but also the church, and also the temples, and also all the others. Uh, where is the rumah kebajikan, welfare, to, 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 to all? Why is there such term as homeless people? There shouldn't be a term, homeless people. Eh? Hungry people shouldn't be. Eh? In such a rich country as Malaysia, now getting poorer. Okay, don't know. Okay. Uh, so here is something, uh, as well as a tragedy for me, 27 years in architecture school, and all they talk about is architecture without the humanity part of it. Okay, uh, so coming to a democratic society, Democratic society, what is it? Oh, it's voting once every five years. It's not. It's a society of individuals and communities where every member is responsible for the well-being of other members through mutual consultation and discussion. We discuss. We don't go and say, China, Babi, Sana, and things like that. Right? Or I am Melayu and racist and Islam is racist. Well, what is this? Right? Why do we let these people say these things? Okay. Uh, the intellectual members of the society seek to serve as a conscience for the masses. Uh, this is the role of the academic, which is, I'm very sad that uh, 
we don't do this. We have thousands of professors and associate professors, but when I read the news about people commenting on issues, there's only a handful. A handful means one hand or maybe two, at the most. Where are all these professors? You know, talk, writing and saying that uh, the stakeholders of public universities are the people of Malaysia, but they are not getting their money's worth because they are not engaged in the society. So leadership of the collectives is fully conscious of their temporal responsibilities as representative of groups of individuals and communities. And the prime minister, the minister, they must know that they are only representative. People like to use the word political master. I don't. I say political representative. Uh, so can you imagine if how are we going to give them this sense when you look at the planning of Putrajaya, you come up, go into a big gate, and then cross and go into some basement or somewhere and then come into the building. If I were designing, I would go then force them to park somewhere where they have to come up to the plaza level and walk about 100 meters or on a travel letter, kalau tak lara, you know, with the two sides of the square, with people having their marketplace and things like that, they can exactly see all the cabinet members walking through to the parliament where they can go up to their top floor, 20th floor, and have a full glass wall looking at the world, and directly underneath is the cemetery. Okay? So that's planning. That is planning. You take zoop, macam tu, but if you go look, oh, city of Baghdad, circle, center here, that one, that's trying to prevent somebody from invasion, that is military. Okay? But if you look at this, then you will see this. No, sorry, somebody has already done it. Okay? Normal foster, very Islamic. Okay? You can go up to the dome and then you can see inside. Huh? Public can come up to the ceiling uh, roof and then can see inside all the parliamentarians and then see, oh, Perdana Menteri tak datang lagi. Eh? You know? Masih absent. Okay? Of course, not Malaysians for the Menteri, it's the German for the Menteri, of course. Yeah. So, that is Rakyat Hakim Negara, that is architecture from a man who understands what democracy is. Nah, itulah, values. You tak paham democracy, macam mana you nak buat? Okay, so that is the problem that we are facing and I can go into a discourse on all this uh, aspect, but I think I have to go straight into my idea of... Uh, Reminders. Lastly, we say humanistic spirituality. Uh, we are at one in peace and in harmony with all human beings of all races, cultures. And this is how I, I, I view myself as a Muslim. I am at peace with all of them. There are some Muslims who cannot be at peace. These people are non-Muslim. They are our enemies. They have the George Bush idea of we are either with us or you are with them. You know, I mean, that is not good. But to me, as a Muslim, I am at peace with all. Okay? We are at one with living things, we are at one with landscape, we are one with our ego self, thinking self, and internal self. I don't have time today, sorry, to talk about this. This is a very important aspect of um, your self. Uh, we are at one with our Creator and loves all because we love all that He created. Now, look at this building. Now, this building is a wonderful expression of an emotion. The architect had a strong feeling of oneness, oneness with existence, with nature, with this and with that, and he produced this. This is unprecedented. Huh? Modern architecture is unprecedented because it follows the ideals of socialism, huh? of, of democracy, and here of spirituality, what we call universal spirituality, to be at one with nature. That is very Islamic to me. Okay? And an architect called me, Din, how can you say that? He is a non-Muslim, you know? In Indonesia, oh, tidak boleh pakai, Pak. Dia, no. a professor from Prasetran. Okay. Look at this student project, a mosque with a bazaar at the center. And now if these areas are developed, then you see the oneness where all people, Muslim, non-Muslim, coming to buy things, 
And then when prayer time comes, then the shops will be closed for a few minutes, and then they will pray. But the buildings are all, you know, uh, it's open. It's, it's something that comes in, goes out. You know, you, you can be with part of the community. Not if you have an architect design first, you put a wall, 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 one gate, two gate, you know, uh, and parking, and then. And then uh, what kind of design? That is a typological approach. You think? The political, social, and economic life values from the Sunnah of the Prophet are essential to adapt, adapt and adopt. Okay, so that is where we get the planning of cities. Well, here is my eight reminders. Now I'm not speaking as an ustaz today. I'm sorry, I'm just this is just what I practice myself. Okay, I didn't get this from any book. This is how from all the years of reading from university days and contemplating and, and, and well, this is basically uh, what I, I came up with for myself, okay, as a Muslim uh, surviving in the world. So, reminder of God, yeah, reminder of ibadah and perjuangan, meaning that we have to do something about our society. Uh, uh, reminder of life hereafter, how, how do we remind ourselves? Of that reminder of humility. If we don't have humility, then we'll say, "I da pandai dah, tak pernah belajar kita." You won't learn from your wife. You won't learn from your children. You won't learn from uh, non-Muslim. You won't learn from anybody. Nah, because I'm me. I'm Tajudin Rasdi. I'm wrote 50 books. I'm a Muslim, so I don't mean anybody else. Uh, that's that's not humility. Okay? Reminder of the wakaf and public welfare. Your investment when you go to the barzah when you die. Okay, what is your investment? Yeah, you can buy a house and then sell it. That's another investment. It's a different form. Cultural tolerance. The thing that we lost. The compassion. When the Prophet came into Makkah, he did not hang anybody. Hmm? The Prophet, when he was uh, tortured by the people of Ta'if, and Jibril came, I will destroy this whole city if you say so. No. I am a mercy to mankind. They are just ignorant. Let them be. Okay, that is the strength of the prophet. Sini pak putih masuk penjara dua minggu. Somebody allow the Buddhist to go into a surah or he himself created dua hari penjara. What is this? What is this? Where's the compassion? The problem? The prophet Muhammad couldn't forgive Wahsi who killed and murdered Hamza for a few days. Ultimately, he did. Okay, that was to the extent of his vengeance, that's all. Okay. Reminder of sustainability. We are Khalifa, we are renting the place. So you better leave the place in a better manner. Okay. And accountability, that every single thing we do, there is an accounting. Okay, I have to go quite quickly. Sorry, cannot go bit one by one. But here it is. The vision of an Islamic or city. It will be overwhelming of nature because the only thing that we can see about God is the trees and the water bodies. If you look at this building, this is built by man. Okay? If you look at yourself, and it's covered with clothes, built or, or, or created by man. So everything you see from, you go from your house, your apartment, to your workplace, to your tadika and whatever, it's all man. And if you don't pass things that are done by God, for instance, the trees and the plants, or whatever, satu batang pokok sebelah MRT, you know, then there's a problem. Okay? So that's basically the idea, and if you can contemplate between these two buildings, which one is more Islamic? This one or this one? Traditionalists, you will say, oh, must be young, this is populist. Okay, got the domes, got the, you know. But you look at the verses of the Quran, it is something like that. Okay? Now, if you. Okay, so that is a reminder of God. Okay? Then this is the reminder of ibadah or perjuangan, meaning um, the core meaning of the life of Muslim is the idea of not just personal ritual like this lady, but also. Well, not asking people to demonstrate or anything like that, but but it shows the the, 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 the various responsibilities that we have as a, as a Muslim. Okay? As a Muslim, cannot go sit somewhere. Eh? If you look at the, um, uh, we have to be with the community. 
thing. So, um, shall I not inform you of something more excellent in degree than fasting, prayer, and almsgiving? The people replied, yes, Prophet of Papa. He said, it's putting right between people. Okay, better than fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. Of course, uh, maybe sunnah, but, 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 but that's what he said. Okay, so you cannot sit comfortably in front of your 60-inch television and watch the world go by. You have to be part of it. And how is this reflected in uh, in, in architecture? Uh, see, he who separates from community within a span takes off the noose of Islam from his neck. Okay. So to me, it represents how we place in the city planning not only the mosque but other buildings like the church and you know, all this, uh, the temples. Why? Because the temples and the churches are the ones that teaches human beings to be human. Science teach how to invent a car so that you can move. Science teach how to live in a house. But it cannot teach about being good to one another, about helping each other. And all these religion teaches, you must help one another. If not, your ego will get flared up and then you will not have peace in this world. So this uh, are very important uh, in, in relation to uh, having what is called uh, the idea of uh, Islamic city planning that you have to put uh, in place. Uh, some people are very uncomfortable and say, ah, we don't like lah, all these non-Muslim. But I want to show you what uh, Satya Narayan Goenka said. He is the father of Vipassana meditation. Vipassana is a uh, it's a retreat where you go for 10 days and don't speak. Don't speak for 10 days. Jangan bercakap. So he says, do not talk about converting Muslims to Christians or Christians to Muslims. Talk about converting people from ignorance to knowing, from indifference to compassion, and from intolerance to tolerance. You know, these people, in the, he gave a talk in the United Nations. Well, you got the Muslims there, the Christians, and the Buddhists, and the Hindus, the Gado, Basa, interfaith. You know, you're encroaching upon us, encroaching upon them, things like that. So why are you talking like this? Hmm? Trying to prevent conversion of this to that, this to that. Right? that that's not something that you should be doing. In Surah Yasin, uh, the apostles that came... Our sustainer knows that we have indeed been sent unto you, but we are not bound to do more than clearly deliver the message entrusted to us. So Muslims are not out to go and convert here and there. It is only to deliver the message as clearly as possible. And then it is up to God. Somebody wants to come into Islam or not. But here we have, hold on, you do that. If you write this Allah in this, in this word, then the Muslim will convert. Oh, well, what is this? You monopolize the word Allah when it's not supposed to be monopolized. Okay? Okay, now I understand there are some political people playing things around. I, I, I'm not stupid. Okay? But then, how come so many Malays are stupid? Including professors. Especially professors. Huh? I know this because I am, a, you know, move around them and the way they talk, I say, wah, bangang juga, okay? <laughs> So planning and design of these buildings and their landscaping must be done in making it inviting and easy for public participation. Once I had a studio in UTM, my last studio, a master studio, we had, I did a, a universal design of religious buildings. Maknanya looking at universal values. One of the universal values is to berkawan dengan orang, you know, to be with friends and to be with others and things like that. So I said, don't design the fence. You put something like a gallery or something in front. So when a student presented a church that has a gallery and eating space and people can come in, one of the jury put up a computer and said, this is the constitution of Malaysia. Christians cannot convert Muslim. Why are you designing like this? I kata, dia bukan nak convert. Dia nak kenal. Tak kenal, tak cinta. Macam mana? Yelah, cinta dia masuk Christian. Uh, okay. Macam mana nak cakap dengan orang macam ni? Rupanya dia memang oh, ahli isma. Okay, so. So fences must be turned into elements that invite creative use and not throw people off. And that's another topic. Uh, recently I gave a topic on uh, what do we do with external spaces of the mosque. Tidak 
dibenarkan berniaga di sini oh, that's all thing but actually it has other other ways Okay, uh, reminder of life here after uh, the cemetery is the most important thing it's the gateway to the here after it's the parza and if you attend any seminar on Islamic city planning and if you want to catch out the speaker you ask this question where is the cemetery and then you definitely cannot answer okay because the prophet said in one of the hadiths uh, is that you must re- you must think of death 70 times a day not number 70 meaning many times a day and how can you think of death when you from your house you get into your car and you come to UPM you did not pass by a cemetery did you pass by a cemetery I don't think so maybe there was a cemetery but the majlis cleverly put the trees so that you don't see it okay in my idea of Islamic city you will pass by cemeteries and the best cemetery as well is in Putrajaya, right next to the Prime Minister office. Okay? Okay? We have to be reminded, kalau tidak kita arrogant, kita, we are so, you know, full of ourselves. And that is a very important element. You forget cemetery in my studio, you fail. Okay? Okay. So, uh, this is a Chinese cemetery. I live next to a Chinese cemetery for 15 years. And I, I admire how the Chinese take care. Yeah, they have to pay for this and all that, you know. But they are really, you know, into the idea of their ancestors. You know, Muslims laugh and they are day war. I look upon it as they regard cemetery as part and parcel of their life. My friend said, in a Chinese there, Prof, we have to buy a house, a cemetery, and uh, they better complain, something like that. Okay? So, I admire their, their idea of that. Okay? So, this is uh, the idea of uh, how in the Prophet's time, when, when the Prophet sees a procession, of him, then he would do something like stand up, and we see a point of the Prophet stand up or until he comes and move away, slow to the ground, so, so, something like that. But you don't have to do it that now. But here, when somebody dies, you put it in the car and then transport it somewhere. In the olden days, when my father died, they have to carry him to the cemetery. And so many people would see and then they would, you know, uh, say the dua and things like that. But our city planning, senang saja, very efficient. Nampak dalam ambulance, pergi kat, you know, somewhere, something like that. We don't have the procession anymore. So how do we design it in such a way that from your house, there's a small procession, go to the mosque, and from the mosque, then ship off. So at least people can see. Nampak? The barakah is very important to remind people, you know. Now we don't see it all. Okay, so that is something uh, of city planning implication to me about that. Humility. Muslim must be humble before God and leaders must be humble before uh, who they lead. Uh, prophet is humble. No one can distinguish him from narrated uh, Anas Bimali. While we were sitting with the prophet in the mosque, a man came riding on camel. He made his camel kneel down in the mosque, tied his forehead and then said, Who amongst you is Muhammad? At that time, the Prophet was sitting among us. He couldn't recognize. If you go to Putrajaya, you stupid lah. You say, who is the Prime Minister's... Yeah, that's the building that we saw. Though. Okay? Sorry. Yeah, so, uh, I, these are the hadiths. I mean, I, you can just read them later on. Uh, but I just want to show this picture. This is how we design administration center. Hmm? This is how we design. And then people from Islamic countries want to do an Islamic city. This is also how they design. I would design like this. This is Broad Acre City. Sorry. This is Broad Acre City. Huh? From Frank Lorraine. Where is the administrative center? I put that apart. That apart. Eh? Can you see? I can't see. Yeah. How about this? This is the uh, pejabat ke ataupun Kowe uh, punya ni ke or what? Uh, no, this is the uh, 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 municipal council designed by Alba Alto. These people understand the role of democracy in society. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's statement about democracy. He, Frank Lloyd Wright, did not want government to be bigger than the people. The people is bigger than the government. That is how city design. 
and the prophet, eh, when, in, in, when Umar ibn Khattab wants to say something, people say, wait, why is your dress so long? Ah, somebody can actually say something to the leader, Amirul Mu'min. So, uh, have a contemplation about that. Reminder of wakaf and public welfare. You know, we have to do something uh, in Islam. Uh, when you die, you leave your, your children, you leave your uh, knowledge and something of charity. So that's why Muslims must be very careful with their children and, and their wealth. And if, you're not, if, you, if you go and sponsor a book by Dr. Tanyudin, say like, like, like this book, they say, <laughs> uh, then as long as people are reading this book, then, then you will get the knowledge from it. Okay? And the, the, the reward from it. Okay? So, uh, where are all these uh, places? Eh? In the olden days of Islam, the caravanserai are being endowed by certain leaders. When people come, they can stay for free. There are hotels, of course, for you to pay. But it's the responsibility of the Islamic government to have places for people who travel. That, 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 that. In Malaysia, when somebody asked, what is the best Islamic uh, architecture that you see? I said, the Wakaf. Not the 500 million ringgit mosque. The Wakaf is, that, is the one that represents Islamic architecture. Okay, uh, so here we see that uh, the Prophet Muhammad in this hadith was very sad when he saw some poor people and then he called the Muslims and, and asked for arms and then they came and they brought to the mosque and then they gave it to these people. Okay, so this is uh, part and parcel of the Islamic community. And it is, would be wonderful if there is a disaster, mosques, churches, temples, uh, can work together in order to alleviate the, the suffering, say, the affluence in Kelantan. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry I have not much time to read the hadith for you, but the, the hadith is there. It is supposed to show the values, not the architecture. Okay, This is supposed to show the values. Don't look for architecture here. Look for the values, and then you design the architecture for it. What is the real poor? The rights of guests. Guests three days to your house, but what about to your city? Okay. Love thy neighbor. Uh, our neighbors, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, there is some, some, some respect for, for that. There are street, uh, streets and public rights. Okay. This is the hadith that I said, when a man dies, his session discontinues except sadaka, knowledge, and uh, pious child. So, uh, something that you build or sponsor uh, for you to, uh, to have an investment in. Cultural tolerance. Okay? Cultural tolerance. The prophet tolerate many kinds of cultures. And here is a story about some people playing music and then Abu Bakar said, no, go away, this is Shaitan's instrument. And the Prophet said, no, 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 let them be. These are the tribe of this, they like music. So, let. so, so he's very tolerant of that. Yeah? I wanted to write a book called Not the Islam I Know. Yeah? Meaning that the thing that I see is, this is not the Islam that, 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 that I know. It's in here. Okay. Uh, so here about Aisha watching people play spears uh, with the Abyssinians, okay? And then uh, I want to show something, uh, so very important hadith. There was a dead body that was being carried away and the Prophet gave respect by standing up and, and, and praying for, for him. And somebody said, hey, Ya Rasulullah, he was told that the man, dead man was a Jew. Upon this, the Prophet remarked, Why, was he not a human being? Or did he not have a soul? The prophet giving respect. Not like us, ching chang, ching chang, oh, ching, no, ni, buat bisin lagi, dengan mati, ni, mati lah, senyap, senyap, tak boleh ke? You know? I actually like the Chinese one, because they announce the death, oh, okay, so, we And here, we just put in the car, if it's a soup, then go to the cemetery. Yeah. Um, 
So here it's about praying. Uh, if you are an imam, don't be too long. People, you are scaring people away. Whoever leads people in prayer must be brief for behind him are weak age people who have urgent business. So how have you tackled this in life, in architecture, in planning to help different people, the aged, people not from your culture, and things like that? Okay. So we're coming to the end. A uh, reminder of sustainability that man is a khalifa. So how do we uh, design uh, cities so that we do not hurt the environment for others? I don't think I need to do this, but it is uh, there as an attitude. There's many hadiths about the Prophet um, um, forbidding the Muslim army to destroy plants and things like that. Okay, so it is part and parcel of the, uh, of the uh, Islamic value system. Okay. A beautiful hadith. You know, you want to know I love reading the hadith. Okay. So this is lastly, it's about accountability and uh, what we do in this world uh, will be accounted. Okay. And so we have to be careful. This is about rationalization. Are you going to put four minutes? Okay. Really? Why? Tongku suro ga? Tapala tongku suro bubo saja lah. Then it's okay when God asks, it's tongku suro. Then jawab tongku lah. Senang cerita. Okay? So, uh, I was not commanded to build high mosques. Uh, this why I said, in Christianity, they have something similar to that, uh, what Pugin says. And therefore, that became the idea of the new architecture. Right? And that's why I said that this kind of hadith have not been clashed and therefore we have typological ideas of Islamic architecture. I the hadith because I know this, the members is going to use it, but uh, I might not have time to, to explain this. But all of this is in this book, actually. Okay? That's why I brought it down. If you are interested, uh, you, could, you could get the book. Uh, here how the Sahaba was uh, advised not to build uh, excessively. Not because it's against domes, but it's not advised not to build excessively. Do Malaysia build excessively? Nah, well, you know, crystal moss and all that. Yeah, okay. So, very Islamic. Yeah? All right, uh, public safety. You will be accountable also when a child dies. You know, sorry, yeah? Muslim architect will be accountable when a child drops from this simplistic corridor design. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah? I mean, you sampai akhirat nanti, eh, nanti dulu jangan masuk syurga lagi, ni, 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 ni. Yeah? What about this? What, that, what's the regulation? What, what regulation? You don't have any sense of people, uh, children will always climb things. Why don't you have some safety measures? But the regulation doesn't require it, and the client's not. Uh, well, you, you you have to you have to convince the client. Huh? You say this is not a good design. This one for office, okay lah. Three feet at the thirty inches, cukup. But for housing, pun sama juga. Three, you know, four feet, uh, three feet, uh, and then thirty. Mana boleh sama? Ini rumah ada anak-anak, office tak ada. Unless there's a new general manager who's three years old, lah. Tidak tahu lah. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, sorry to say that is okay. So uh, here is the final slide, just to end it. Uh, yes, would you like to say that? In summary, my idea of Islam, Islamic city planning, first and foremost, must come from the values of, of you as a Muslim. And the value of you as a Muslim is inclusive of you as a civilized nation, as a democratic nation. And, and, and this is not separated. And we can learn from whatever the best. There was a research done by one professor who put up a criteria of Islamic city planning, of city, the, the, the best uh, Islamic city. And the, the top cities are somewhere in Norway or Scandinavia. Yeah? And Islamic uh, so-called Muslim-dominated countries are number 30. Malaysia, oh, Saudi Arabia is number 70 or something. Okay, but Malaysia number 30, but the first no Muslim countries. This is using the so-called Islamic 
value system. Maybe you should get that uh, that uh, report. It's about social, economic things, and I think that is very essential because that is architecture. Architecture is not from a book that has buildings. Yeah, when I see my PhD student go buy books of architecture, I say this is the wrong book. You know, you don't buy those books anymore. Only undergraduate and 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 and, and uh, maybe master student will have to buy some of these books. But for PhD, you have to do other books: philosophy, history, social science. Then only we can have meaning. Okay, architecture does not come from architecture. Okay, so uh, that is my ideas. Uh, I hope that uh, maybe that uh, some of it can be used in in relation to constructing what is called the principles of. Uh, the Islamic city and architecture. Thank you very much. that I have had for what I term as the idea of Islamic architecture. But I will promise you definitely that uh, I will not be talking along the lines that is usually being talked about. Usually when people talk about Islamic city planning or Islamic architecture, they come from what is called an object-centered discourse. Uh, but I come from a value-centered discourse, and uh, I think this is a bit uh, different than, than the others. So I call the talk uh, Democracy, Humanism and the Eight Reminders in Muslim Life Lessons for Design of Cities and Buildings The Eight Reminders is actually what is it as a Muslim, uh, as, an, as an individual how I remind myself being a Muslim and from this we can actually build cities and also buildings In fact, in architecture and city planning, planning it should start from that, uh, but many of us want to use the quick way. Usually, we use what we call typological studies, although it is valid. But uh, we have to look at its restrictions. Now, in some mission, uh, in a summary, this is what uh, my my life work has been: is simply to get away from um, or to um, be understanding of uh, what is called the object-centered discourse, and then to uh, put us into what is called a value-centered approach, uh, because to my mind, Islamic architecture, the, the growth of the body of that knowledge, did not develop uh, in the manner in which modernism uh, came about. Uh, if you are a student of modernism, you can see that it developed there's a certain way that it has evolved. But uh, Islamic architecture, the discourse, only started after the, um, the evolution of these ideas uh, have come about, and therefore they have borrowed mainly from uh, the, uh, the discourses. Now, borrowing is okay. Uh, for instance, if you don't know how to be a Muslim, then you follow, say, uh, an individual, a ustaz, something like that. But it is very limited when you uh, encounter different things in life and, and, and so forth. Let's say you follow someone and uh, he's been with the Malay community, but then when you are in a non-Malay community, then there are things that uh, becomes a big problem. And so you cannot, therefore, use the typological model anymore. So that's why I say here the values of the Sunnah and sustainable design as anchors with technology and cultural dynamic as variable. So what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad and looking at how we learn from him. Now, I've made a study of uh, over 20,000 hadiths from Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, Muwatta, and, and also the uh, historical uh, writing of uh, Sirah Ibn Hisha. And, and, and this is the actual YouTube of the Prophet's life. If you're going to click YouTube, you can watch almost anything nowadays. But if you want to YouTube the Prophet Muhammad, it is in this hadith. And I did that so that I could understand what Islam is. 
So when I studied that, then I look at there's so many implications, architecture, uh, planning, politics, society, and always uh, the opinion I have would be at odds with what with most of the established understanding of politics and society. Uh, because I come from directly from understanding the prophet's life, not from some ustas or institution, although that is also commendable, but we have to know its restriction. So in short, uh, tomorrow I'm talking uh, at PAM. I will elaborate this part more, but today I will not uh, do so. And just to say that if you look at this uh, discourse in revivalism uh, or structuralism, which is simply taking a form and putting in new structures. Geometricism, as if Islam is the only religion that has geometry, which is something very, very strange. Um, and also making buildings in a geometrical form, and therefore that is Islamic. Or metaphor, Quran, and uh, palm trees, and, and things like that. Not to belittle them, but it has a limited discourse. Tomorrow I will talk more about this and, and going into the criticism of each of the discourse. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the summary of what I have in this slide, uh, if we use um, historical typology or a borrowed discourse, it's something to start with. But it is limited and it is very restricted. Because now we are in the modern world and in, in Malaysia we can see all the issue of our Allah issue and all these uh, other so-called controversial issues. We see that we are in a, 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 an area, an era of uh, new things and such typological approach cannot offer a good solution. I'm not saying that you cannot do this. Uh, build mosques with two minarets in UTM you have six minarets you know, but uh, this is something that perhaps the research group have to also look at now, many people start by talking about what is in Islam but I'm going to go over that what is this Islam and what is in humanity, and this is something a very controversial topic it shouldn't be controversial but apparently it is so uh, the thing that many people don't know is the, 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 these two points, morality and the clash of values. Now, this is something which no PhD student have, have, have looked at, that modern architecture started with a clash of values between Christian values and technology and function and politics and, and what we call natural sustainability. Frank Lloyd Wright was talking about sustainability way before people invented the word regionalism or green architecture. Okay, and um, August Dispugin uh, was one of those uh, very devout Christians who were talking about rationality and justification of ornaments, things like that. Now, tomorrow uh, at Recta, I'll go into that and I will show how these Christian values spark off um, an interest in, in, in a new architecture. And then the political values of democracy, of socialism, of communism that govern this. This is the thing that we are very weak in. This is the thing that we have inherited the form of modern architecture, both in its building as well as its in discourse. But we don't spend time to understand the political, social, cultural, and, 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 and religious uh, context of that time in Europe. And that's where we are lost. We are lost because we then only follow typologies. When we want to talk about Malaysian architecture, we go to the Malay house. When we talk, we don't ask the question what is Malaysian is all about. And so when we talk about Islamic architecture, we go back to uh, so-called Middle Eastern cities, uh, although that is not wrong. As I say, it's good to start with. But uh, this is the... That's why I said that uh, Islamic architecture discourse did not uh, begin with the clash of values. And this is what I'm trying to have. So Islamic architecture must uh, be understood fully, the historical context of modernism, and to initiate its own clash of values. This is the, the thing that I will elaborate. Not today, but tomorrow as I say, but here I'm giving you the, the end product of it. 
Now, in order to, uh, to come up with the idea of what is so-called Islamic city planning and architecture, then we have to reconstruct the foundation of it. And the foundation, uh, we have to look at who we are as a people, yeah? who we are as a society, who we are as a community. And I'm proposing uh, this uh, idea of uh, looking at Islam and the idea of civilization and of civilized people. And I said in my writings that uh, I, as a Muslim, I am inclusive, meaning I, I, I see the goodness in all, in other religions, in Buddhism, in Christianity, in Hinduism, in democracy, in socialism, the goodness. But there are people who say, look, once you have embraced Islam, you have to forget about all this. Because these, people, these other things are all kachao, saja. You know, well, if possible, we don't want them at all. I have found many attitudes like that, many attitudes. To me, when I read the Quran and read the Hadith, uh, it is something that allows me to immerse myself in the, in the greatness of human, human civilization. Okay? Because the God that we know in the Quran, as I know it, is the God that is encompassing of all. But other people say, no, this God is different than that God. And then uh, you do not know the problem of the definition of God unless you read Karen Armstrong. Say, how can you express God in words? Eh? Well, God is not like humans, but you have to use human words and human experience. Yes, we can understand it, but only a little bit. And then you close it and say other gods are no longer Islam. And so there is a, a problem there. So Islam and the idea of democracy and the imagined nation. Okay. Now when we talk about nationalism or national identity, we have to talk about a term called imagined community. My, my readings now is not on architecture. I'm reading about the formation of Malaysia, what are the, uh, the, the, the discourses about uh, the, what is Malayu and what is Malaysia and, and, and all this. This is my reading nowadays. It's not, no longer about architecture. Because if I am to define a Malaysian architecture, and then we have to answer the first and foremost question, what is Malaysian all about? Uh, the idea of an imagined nation, you can be Malay, and suddenly I'm born, and somebody says, you are Malayu. Although my family came from Patani 150 years ago, and uh, we are not known as Pendatang. And, but uh, this is when you are uh, in Malaysia, a Malaysian, that is the imagined community. You are Malay, you are Chinese, you are Hin Indian, you are Kadasan. But then when you are in Malaysia, this is called imagined community. And what is it? And this is the, 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 the problem uh, that we have to understand and in the universities as well as in the schools, it is not that with. And then we wonder why we have all this problem of racism and extremism and all that. We simply don't know. We are all Malays, Chinese, Indians, Kadazan living in a country called Malaysia, which is defined, uh, defined uh, geopolitically, that's all. But we don't have the heart or the imagined community. Okay? So in Islam, uh, I wonder one question perhaps maybe Dr. Ismawi or some Islamic scholar can answer. When were Muslims considered Muslims and when were they Islam considered Islam? Because when Islam came with the Prophet, he didn't say this is Islam. It, the, the word is not, it wasn't there. Okay? You must understand that. He was just being good, and before that, there were also being people who were doing good. But then something went on, people began to put layers of culture, layers of politics, layers of this, and then you have to peel it off and say, look, 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 we have to do good, okay? Believe in God and do good, give charity, help others. There's no name of Islam, it's just being good. Eckhart Tolle in his book says that once people start to divide themselves and call themselves Muslims, Islam, Christians, then the problem of humanity becomes because you compartmentalize things. You identify with your ego of your communities and that is the problem. In fact, it is okay to be called Islam and to be praying and to be wearing the tudung, but don't say, look, I'm better than you. 
I'm better than everybody else. Everybody else who is not like me is going to go to hell. I don't know where you pick that up, but uh, this is the problem, is said, when you study such religion from institutions, but not going on a self uh, examination uh, from the direct to the sources, which is actually the, 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 the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad. And Islam and the idea of universal humanistic spirituality, uh, do, we, do we have that? And I, I, I think we do. But many people say, you know, Islam is Islam. Universal humanistic spirituality is nothing to do with Islam. So before we uh, go into the discussion about uh, what a Muslim life is, uh, let's look what is civiliz a civilized society. Now, I'm not a scholar in uh, social science and, and philosophy. And I only know uh, from my experiences, and, and I put up this thing, uh, say, a civilized society is a society of individuals, communities, and citizens who respect one another's differences and resolve racial, political, and cultural conflict through rational and well-mannered discourse. Now, let us ask this question. Is Islam in this? Is Islam civilized? I know some people don't like the definition of Westerners, uh, of civilization, and you must use Islam. Yeah, but, but I think Islam respects one another's differences from what I understand the Prophet's life, and I can show you from the Hadith. So Islam is civilized, and we can have a civilized discourse. Why is it that Islam never participated very well in interfaith discussion? Okay. Uh, so this is something funny, and I'm going to say something quite interesting uh, a bit later about um, uh, uh, S. N. Goenka. Okay, a civilized society is one in which no member of that society shall suffer from a one of the basic necessity of life and dignified existence. Basic shelter, basic housing, basic food. You don't, you know, if you are civilized, then, then people shouldn't be begging to buy a house, to get a house, and things like that. I mean, the issue now, housing. How can it become like that? When somebody asked me, um, well, how do we solve the problem of housing? I said, when I was in the UK, I lived in council houses. If that government can pro provide for the poor like me, why is it that we cannot provide for our general populace? Like that. Council houses. Yes, we did once. DBKL have their DBKL flags and all that, but then suddenly everything disappeared. Everything diswastaka and all that. So that is not Islamic, but this is a civilized idea. A civilized society is one that affords freedom of individuals to aspire creatively through technology without undermining the economic and moralistic well being of others. Now we have a problem. When I want to be creative, let's say I'm trying to create a story about time travel, about, uh, say, reincarnation. I'm thinking of several novels now. That's another part of my life, trying to think of writing novels now. After 50 books on architecture, Chukola, right? So now we want to write novels about, about saying something about society. But we have a problem. A certain group of people who call themselves uh, Department of Religious Affairs say, no, you cannot do this. You cannot have this because this is not in Islam. Uh, you have a very small knowledge. The whole totality of human knowledge is nothing but a drop in an ocean. Okay? We must admit that. If we don't admit that, then we are not humble. If we are not humble, then we will never accept other people's opinion and views. Well, this is a, a problem when it comes to uh, a restricted idea of Islam. Now, we look at the statement by uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Farouk Musa, in, in talking about Islamic politics. Instead of, uh, instead of uh, uh, endless discussion over the ideal Islamic state and its system, like Islamic economy, uh, we should focus on fundamentals of civil state, such as justice freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, good governance, separation of power, rule of law, respect for human rights, and economic equality. So, we're not saying all these others are not made, but when you have a problem of, let's say again, Islamic state, Islamic economy, Islamic city planning, Islamic this and Islamic that, though the gesture is nice, 
but you trap yourself once you use the term because your understanding of the term is limited. Okay? Um, people cannot be arrogant enough to say, I know everything. I don't know everything. Okay? So, so this is the idea when, we, we, when, 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 when somebody like this says like this, then she say, oh, he's a, he's a liberal. Now liberal is a dirty word in Islam. Okay? He's progressive. Once progressive was very good. Now even moderate cannot be used. Okay? So, uh, not sure what else to, to, to speak of. Okay? I think I'm all three, moderate, progressive, liberal. There it goes, there it goes then up to the window. Okay? So, I uh, don't like to use those words. I never use it to myself. I thought this was the Islam that I was talking about from the Prophet. I never used those words. But other people label and brand and, and then take off. Okay? When you look at the hadith of this, the Prophet, um, he, he said that uh, Allah says, O son of Adam, I fell ill and you visited me not. He will say, O Lord, and how should I visit you when you are the Lord of the worlds? He will say, Do you not know that my servant so and so had fallen ill and you visited him not? Did you not know that had you witnessed him, would you have found me with him? So here he's talking about compassion. Compassion to another human being. Alright? Where you can look at this and if you are a good architect or a good planner, from there you could translate it into so many different planning principles. Okay? So here is a civilized religion, a civilized way of life. And that is how it says. Oh, son of Adam, I asked you for food and you fed me not. He would say, Oh Lord, and how should I feed you when you are Lord of the worlds? Did you not know that my servant? So here is about basic necessity of life. In my mind, somebody who is poor, somebody who doesn't have something to eat, somebody who does not have a place to sleep, can just go to a mosque and sleep there. Eh? Whether he is a Muslim or non-Muslim, or whether he is a penagi dada, drug addict, just go. That's to my mind, but not to the Malay mind. Oh, tak boleh. Kotor. Bukan orang Islam. In the early days of the Prophet, he has a place called the Sufa space. In the Sufa space, it is a space where people go there to sleep, to stay there. Okay? Temporarily or for a long time just to be with the Prophet or because you don't have anywhere else to stay. And you look at our 100 million ringgit mosque where that spirit is there. Now, that is about the mosque. Now, how about city planning? How about the idea of uh, uh, housing? How about certain other ways in which you could... Uh, so not only the mosque, but also the church, and also the temples, and also all the others. Uh, where is the rumah kebajikan, welfare to, 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 to all? Why is there such term as homeless people? There shouldn't be a term, homeless people. Eh? Hungry people shouldn't be. Eh? In such a rich country as Malaysia, now getting poorer. Okay, don't know that. Uh, so here is something, uh, as well as a tragedy for me, 27 years in architecture school, and all they talk about is architecture without the humanity part of it. Okay, uh, so coming to a democratic society, Democratic society, what is it? Oh, it's voting once every five years. It's not. It's a society of individuals and communities where every member is responsible for the well-being of other members through mutual consultation and discussion. We discuss. We don't go and say, China, Babi, Sana, and things like that. Right? Or, I am Melayu and racist and Islam is racist. Well, what is this? Right? Why do we let these people say these things? Okay. Uh, the intellectual members of the society seek to serve as a conscience for the masses. Uh, this is the role of the academic, which is, I'm very sad that uh, we don't do this. We have thousands of professors and associate professors, but when I read the news about people commenting on issues, there's only a handful. A handful means one hand, or maybe two, that's the most. Where are all these professors, you know, for writing and saying that uh, the stakeholders of public universities are the people of Malaysia, but they are not getting their money's worth. 
because they are not engaged in the society. So leadership of the collective is fully conscious of their temporal responsibilities as representative of groups of individuals and communities. And the prime minister, the minister, they must know that they are only representative. People like to use the word political master. I don't. I say political representative. Uh, so can you imagine if how are we going to give them this sense when you look at the planning of Putrajaya, you come up, go into a big gate, and then cross and go into some basement or somewhere and then come into the building. If I were designing, I would go then force them to park somewhere where they have to come up to the plaza level and walk about 100 meters or on a travel letter, kalau tak larat, you know, with the two sides of the square, with people having their marketplace and things like that, they can exactly see all the cabinet members walking through to the parliament where they can go up to their top floor, 20th floor, and have a full glass wall looking at the world, and directly underneath is the cemetery. Okay? So that's planning. That is planning. It takes zoop, macam tu, but if you go look, oh, city of Baghdad, circle, center here, but that one that's just trying to prevent somebody from invasion, that is military. Okay? But if you look at this, then you will see this. No, sorry, somebody has already done it. Okay? Normal foster, very Islamic. Okay? You can go up to the dome and then you can see inside. Huh? Public can come up to the ceiling uh, roof and then can see inside all the parliamentarians and then see, oh, Perdana Menteri tak datang lagi. Eh? You know? Masih absent. Okay? Of course, not Malaysians for the number three, it's the German for the number three, of course. Yeah. So, that is Rakyat Hakim Negara, that is architecture from a man who understands what democracy is. Nah, itulah values. You tak paham democracy, macam mana you nak buat? Okay, so that is the problem that we are facing, and I can go into a discourse on all this uh, aspect, but I think I have to go straight into my idea of. Uh, Remind this. Lastly, we say humanistic spirituality. Uh, we are at one in peace and in harmony with all human beings of all races, cultures, and religions. This is how I, I, I view myself as a Muslim. I am at peace with all of them. There are some Muslims who cannot be at peace. These people are non Muslim, they are our enemies. They have the George Bush idea of we are either with us or you are with them. You know, I mean, that is not good. But to me, as a Muslim, I am at peace with all. Okay? We are at one with living things, we are one with the landscape, we are one with our ego self, thinking self, and internal self. I don't have time today, sorry, to talk about this. This is a very important aspect of um, your self. Uh, we are at one with our Creator and loves all because we love all that He created. Now, look at this building. Now, this building is a wonderful expression of an emotion. The architect had a strong feeling of oneness, oneness with existence, with nature, with this and with that, and he produced this. This is unprecedented. Huh? Modern architecture is unprecedented because it follows the ideals of socialism, huh? of, of democracy, and here of spirituality, what we call universal spirituality, to be at one with nature. That is very Islamic to me. Okay? And an architect called me, Din, how can you say that? He is a non-Muslim, you know? In Indonesia, he tidak boleh pakai, Pak. Dia professor from Prasetran. Look at this student project, a mosque with a bazaar at the center. And now if these areas are developed, then you see the oneness where all people, Muslim, non-Muslim, coming to buy things. And then when prayer time comes, then the shops will be closed for a few minutes and then they will pray. But the buildings are all, you know, uh, it's open. It's, it's something that comes in, goes out. You know, you, you can be with part of the community. Not, if you have an architect design first, you put a wall, 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 one gate, two gate, you know. Uh, and parking, and then, then. 
a kind of design that is a typological approach. You think form the political, social, and economic life values from the Sunnah of the Prophet are essential to adapt, adapt and adopt. Okay, so that is where we get the planning of cities. Well, here is my eight reminders. Now, I'm not speaking as an ustaz today. I'm sorry, I'm just this is just what I practice myself. Okay, I didn't get this from any book. This is how, from all the years of reading from university days and contemplating, and, and, and well, this is basically uh, what I, I came up with for myself. Okay, as a Muslim uh, surviving in the world. So, a reminder of God. Yeah, reminder of ibadah and perjuangan, meaning that we have to do something about our society. Yeah, uh, reminder of life hereafter. How, how do we remind ourselves of that? Reminder of humility. If we don't have humility, then we'll say, I tak pandai dah, I tak nak belajar lagi dah. You won't learn from your wife, you won't learn from your children, you won't learn from uh, non-Muslim, you won't learn from anybody. Nah, because I'm me, I'm Tajuddin Rasdi, I'm wrote 50 books, I'm a Muslim, so I don't need anybody else. Uh, that's, that's not humility. Okay? Reminder of the wakaf and public welfare, your investment when you go to the barzah, when you die. Okay, What is your investment? Yeah, you can buy a house and then sell it. That's another investment. Uh, it's a different form. Cultural tolerance, the thing that we lost, the compassion. When the Prophet came into Makkah, he did not hang anybody. Hmm? The Prophet, when he was uh, tortured by the people of Taif and Jibril came, I will destroy the whole city if you say so. No, I am a mercy to mankind. They are just ignorant. Let them be. Okay? That is the strength of the Prophet. Sini, Pak Kuteh masuk penjara dua minggu. Somebody allow the Buddhist to go into a surau, which he himself created, dua hari penjara. What is this? What is this? Where's the compassion? The problem? The Prophet Muhammad couldn't forgive Wahsi who killed and murdered Hamza for a few days. Ultimately, he did. Okay, that was to the extent of his vengeance. That's all. Okay. Reminder of sustainability. We are Khalifa. We are renting the place, so we better leave the place in a better manner. Okay, and accountability. That every single thing we do, there is an accounting. Okay, I have to go quite quickly. Sorry, cannot go bit one by one. But here it is, the vision of an Islamic or a city. It will be overwhelming of nature. Because the only thing that we can see about God is the trees and the water bodies. If you look at this building, this is built by man. Okay, if you look at yourself, it's covered with clothes built or, or created by man. So everything you see from, you go from your house, your apartment, to your workplace, to your tadika and whatever, it's all man. And if you don't pass things that are done by God, for instance, the trees and the plants, or whatever, satu batang pokok sebelah MRT, you know, then there's a problem. Okay? So that's basically the idea, and if you can contemplate between these two buildings, which one is more Islamic? This one or this one? Traditionalists will say, oh, mesti lah, yang ni, this is populist. Okay, got the domes, got the, you know. But you look at the verses of the Quran, hey, it's just something like that. Okay? Now, if you... Okay, so that is reminder of God. Okay? Then this is the reminder of ibadah or perjuangan, meaning uh, the core meaning of the life of Muslim is the idea of not just personal ritual like this lady, but also, well, not asking people to demonstrate or anything like that, but, but it shows... The, 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 the various responsibilities that we have as a, as a Muslim. Okay? As a Muslim cannot go sit somewhere. Eh? If you look at the... Um, uh, we have to be with the community. Okay? So... Um, Shall I not inform you of something more excellent in degree than fasting, prayer, and almsgiving? The people replied, yes, Prophet of Papa. He said, it's putting it right between people. Okay, better than fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. Of course, maybe sunnah, but, but 
but, but that's what he said. Okay, so you cannot sit comfortably in front of your 60-inch television and watch the world go by. You have to be part of it. And how is this reflected in uh, in, in architecture? Uh, see, he who separates from community within a span takes off the noose of Islam from his neck. Okay. So to me, it represents how we place in the city planning not only the mosque but other buildings like the church and all this, uh, the temples. Why? Because the temples and the churches are the ones that teaches human beings to be human. Science teach how to invent the car so that you can move. Science teach how to live in a house. But you cannot teach about being good to one another, about helping each other. And all these religion teaches, you must help one another. If not, your ego will get flared up and then you will not have peace in this world. So this uh, are very important uh, in, in relation to uh, having what is called uh, the idea of uh, Islamic city planning that you have to put uh, in place. Uh, some people are very uncomfortable. They say, ah, we don't like lah, all these non-Muslim. But I want to show you what uh, Satya Narayan Goenka said. He is the father of the Pasana meditation. The Pasana is a uh, is a retreat where you go for 10 days and don't speak. Don't speak for 10 days. Jangan eh? bercakap. So he says, do not talk about converting Muslims to Christians or Christians to Muslims. Talk about converting people from ignorance to knowing, from indifference to compassion, and from intolerance to tolerance. You know, these people in the, he gave a talk in the United Nations. Well, you got the Muslims there, the Christians, and the Buddhists, and the Hindus, the Gado, Basra, interfaith. You know, you're encroaching upon us, encroaching upon them, things like that. So, why are you talking like this? Hmm? Trying to prevent conversion of this to that, this to that. Uh, that that's not something that you should be doing. In Surah Yasin, uh, the apostles that came. Our sustainer knows that we have indeed been sent unto you, but we are not bound to do more than clearly deliver the message entrusted to us. So Muslims are not out to go and convert here and there. It is only to deliver the message as clearly as possible. And then it is up to God. Somebody wants to come into Islam or not. But here we have, oh no, you do that. If you write this Allah in this, in this word, then the Muslim will convert. Oh, well, what is this? You monopolize the word Allah when it's not supposed to be monopolized. Okay? Okay, now I understand there are some political people playing things around. I, I, I'm not stupid. Okay? But then, how come so many Malays are stupid? Including professors. Especially professors. Huh? I know this because I am, you know, move around them and the, the way they talk, I say, wow. Bangan juga, kan? So planning and design of these buildings and their landscaping must be done in making it inviting and easy for public participation. Once I had a studio in UTM, my last studio, a master studio, we had, I did a, a universal design of religious buildings. Maknanya looking at universal values. One of the universal values is to berkawan dengan orang, you know, to be with friends and to be with others and things like that. So I said, don't design the fence. You put something like a gallery or something in front. So when a student presented a church that has a gallery and eating space and people can come in, one of the jury put up a computer and said, this is the constitution of Malaysia. Christians cannot convert Muslim. Why are you designing like this? I kata, dia bukan nak convert, dia nak kenal. Tak kenal, tak cinta. Macam mana? Yelah, cinta dia masuk Christian. Uh, okay, macam mana nak cakap dengan orang macam ni? Rupanya dia memang oh, ahli isma. Okay, so. So fences must be turned into elements that invite creative use and not throw people off. And that's another topic. Uh, recently I gave a topic on uh, what do we do with external spaces of the mosque. Tidak dibenarkan berniaga di sini, you know, that sort of thing. But actually it has other, other ways. Okay, uh, reminder of life hereafter. Uh, the cemetery is the most important thing. It's a gateway to the hereafter. It's the parza. And if you attend any seminar on Islamic city planning, and if you want to catch out the speaker, you ask this question, where is the cemetery? And then he'll definitely cannot answer. Okay? 
Because the Prophet said in one of the hadiths uh, is that you must you must think of death 70 times a day, not number 70, meaning many times a day. And how can you think of death when you from your house, you get into your car and you come to UPM, you did not pass by a cemetery. Did you pass by a cemetery? I don't think so. Maybe there was a cemetery, but the majlis cleverly put the trees so that you don't see it. Okay? In my idea of Islamic city, you will pass by cemeteries. And the best cemetery of all is in Putrajaya, right next to the Prime Minister office. Okay? Okay? We have to be reminded, kalau tidak kita arrogant, kita, we are so, you know, full of ourselves. And that is a very important element. You forget cemetery in my studio, you fail. Okay? Okay. So, uh, this is a Chinese cemetery. I lived next to a Chinese cemetery for 15 years. And I, in, I admire how the Chinese take care. Yeah, they have to pay for this and all that, you know. But they are really, you know, into the idea of their ancestors. You know, Muslims laugh and they are day one. I look upon it as they regard cemetery as part and parcel of their life. My friend said, in a Chinese level, prof, we have to buy a house, a cemetery, and uh, they better complete something like that. Okay? So, I admire their, their idea of that. Okay? So, this is uh, the idea of uh, how in the prophet's time, when, when the prophet sees a procession, of it, then he would do something like stand up, and we see a point the prophet stand up or until he comes and move away, slow to the ground, so, so, something like that. But you don't have to do it that now. But here, when somebody dies, you put it in the car, and then transport it somewhere. In the olden days, when my father died, they had to carry him to the cemetery. And so many people would see and then they would, you know, uh, say the du'a and things like that. But our city planning, senang saja, very efficient. Nampak dalam ambulance, pergi kat, you know, somewhere, something like that. We don't have the procession anymore. So how do we design in such a way that from your house, there's a small procession, go to the mosque, and from the mosque, then ship off. So at least people can see, nampak? The barakah is very important to remind people, you know. Now we don't see it all. Okay, so that is something uh, of city planning implication to me about that. Humility. Muslim must be humble before God and leaders must be humble before uh, who they lead. Uh, prophet is humble. No one can distinguish him from narrated uh, Anas bin Malik. While we were sitting with the prophet in the mosque, a man came riding on camel. He made his camel kneel down in the mosque, tied his forehead and then said, Who amongst you is Muhammad? At that time, the Prophet was sitting among us. He couldn't recognize. If you go to Putrajaya, you're stupid. Lah. You say, who's the Prime Minister? That's the building that was saw. Okay? So, uh, I mean, these are the hadiths. I mean, I, you can just read them later on. Uh, but I just want to show this. Picture. This is how we design administration center. Hmm? This is how we design. And then people from Islamic countries want to do an Islamic city. This is also how they design. I would design like this. This is Broad Acre City. Sorry. This is Broad Acre City. Huh? From Frank Lorraine. Where is the administrative center? I put that apart. That apart. Eh? Can you see? I can't see. Yeah. How about this? This is the uh, pejabat ke ataupun Kowe uh, punya ni ke or what? Uh, no, this is the uh, apa ni? Municipal Council designed by Alba Alto. These people understand the role of democracy in society. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's statement about democracy. He, Frank Lloyd Wright, did not want government to be bigger than the people. The people is bigger than the government. And that is how city design. And the prophet, when, in, in, when Umar ibn Khattab wants to say something, people say, wait, why is your dress so long? Ah, somebody can actually say something to the leader, Amirul Mu'min. So, uh, have a contemplation about that. Reminder of wakaf and public welfare. You know, we have to do something 
uh, in Islam, uh, when you die, you leave your, your children, you leave your uh, knowledge and something of charity. So that's why Muslims must be very careful with their children and and their wealth. And if you not, if you if you go and sponsor a book by Dr. Tajuddin, say like 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 this book, they say, <laughs> uh, then as long as people are reading this book, then then you will get the knowledge from it, okay, and the the, the reward from it. Okay. So uh, where are all these uh, places eh? in the olden days of Islam? The caravans ride are uh, being endowed by certain leaders. When people come, they can stay for free. There are hotels, of course, for you to pay, but it's the responsibility of the Islamic government to have places for people who travel. In Malaysia, when somebody asked, what is the best Islamic uh, architecture that you see? I said, the Wakaf, not the 500 million ringgit mosque. The Wakaf is, that, is the one that represents Islamic architecture. Okay, uh, so here we see that uh, the Prophet Muhammad in this hadith was very sad when he saw some poor people and then he called the Muslims and, and asked for arms and then they came and they brought to the mosque and then they gave it to these people. Okay, so this is uh, part and parcel of the Islamic community. And it is, would be wonderful if there is a disaster, mosques, churches, temples, uh, can work together in order to alleviate the, the suffering, say, that the floods in Kelantan. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry I have not much time to read the hadith for you, but the, the hadith is there. It is supposed to show the values, not the architecture. Okay? This is supposed to show the values. Don't look for architecture here. Look for the values, and then you design the architecture for it. What is the real poor? The rights of guests. Guests three days to your house, but what about to your city? Okay. Love thy neighbor. Uh, our neighbors, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, there is some, some, some respect for, for that. There are street, uh, streets and public rights. Okay. This is the hadith that I said, when a man dies, his session discontinues except sadaka, knowledge, and uh, pious child. So, uh, something that you build or sponsor uh, for you to, uh, uh, to have an investment in. Cultural tolerance. Okay? Cultural tolerance. The prophet tolerate many kinds of cultures. And here is a story about some people playing music and then Abu Bakr said, no, go away, this is shaitan's instrument. And the prophet said, no, 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 let, let them be. These are the tribe of this, they like music. So, let, so, so he's very tolerant of that. Yeah? I wanted to write a book called Not the Islam I Know. Yeah? Meaning that the thing that I see is, this is not the Islam that, 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 that I know. It's in here. Okay. Uh, so here about Aisha watching people play spears uh, with the Abyssinians, okay? And then uh, I want to show something, uh, this one, very important hadith. There was a dead body that was being carried away and the Prophet gave respect by standing up and, and, and praying for, for him. And somebody said, hey, Ya Rasulullah, he was told that the man, dead man was a Jew. Upon this, the Prophet remarked, Why? was he not a human being? Or did he not have a soul? The prophet giving respect. Not like us, ching chang, ching chang, oh, ching, no, ni, buat bising lagi, dengan mati, ni, mati, lah, senyap, senyap, tak boleh ke? You know? I actually like the Chinese one, because they announce the dead, oh, okay, it's over here. And here, we just put in the car, if it's a soup, then go to the cemetery. Yeah. Um, so here is about praying. Uh, if you are an imam, don't be too long. People, you are scaring people away. Whoever leads people in prayer must be brief for behind him are weak, the aged people who have urgent business. So how have you tackled this in life, in architecture, in planning to help 
different people, the aged, people not from your culture, and things like that. Okay. So we're coming to the end, a uh, reminder of sustainability that man is a khalifa. So how do we uh, design uh, cities so that we do not hurt the environment for others? I don't think I need to do this, but it is uh, there as an attitude. There's many hadiths about the Prophet uh, uh, forbidding the Muslim army to destroy plants and things like that. Okay, So it is part and parcel of the, uh, of the uh, Islamic value system. Okay. A beautiful hadith. You know, you want to know, uh, I love reading the hadith. Okay. So, this is lastly, it's about accountability. And uh, what we do in this world uh, will be accounted. Okay. And so, we have to be careful. This is about rationalization. Are you going to put four minerals? Okay. Really? Why? Tuanku suruh kan? Tak apalah tuanku suruh, bubur saja lah. Then it's okay. When God asks, it's tuanku suruh. Okay. Tak apa, dia jawab tuanku lah. And senang cerita. Okay. So, uh, I was not commanded to build high mosques. Uh, this is what I said. In Christianity, they have something similar to that, uh, what Pugin says. And therefore, that became the idea of the new architecture. Right? And that's why I said that this kind of hadith have not been clashed and therefore we have typological ideas of Islamic architecture. The hadith because I know this, the members is going to use it, but uh, I might not have time to, to explain this. But all of this is in this book actually. Okay? That's why I brought it down. If you are interested, uh, you, could, you could get the book. Uh, here how the Sahaba was uh, advised not to build uh, excessively. Not because it's against domes, but it's not advised not to build excessively. Do Malaysia build excessively? Nah, well, you know, crystal moss and all that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, very Islamic. Yeah. All right, uh, public safety. You will be accountable also when a child dies. You know, sorry, yeah? Muslim architect will be accountable when a child drops from this simplistic corridor design. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah? I mean, you sampai akhirat nanti, eh, nanti dulu jangan masuk syurga lagi, ni, 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 ni. Yeah? What about this? What, that, what's the regulation? What, what regulation? You don't have any sense of people, uh, children will always climb things. Why don't you have some safety measures? But the regulation doesn't require it, and the client's not. Uh, well, you you have to you have to convince the client. Lah. You say this is not a good design. This one for office, okay lah. Three feet, ada thirty inches, cukup. But for housing, pun sama juga. Three, you know, four feet, ke, three feet, ke, and then mana boleh sama. Ini rumah ada anak-anak, office tak ada. Unless there's a new general manager who's three years old, I tak tahu lah. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, sorry to say that is okay. So uh, here is the final slide, just to end it. Uh, yes, would you like to say that? In summary, my idea of Islam, Islamic city planning, first and foremost, must come from the values of, of you as a Muslim. And the value of you as a Muslim is inclusive of you as a civilized nation, as a democratic nation. And, and, and this is not separated. And we can learn from whatever the best. There was a research done by one professor who put up a criteria of Islamic city planning, or city, the, the, the best uh, Islamic city. And the, the top cities are somewhere in Norway or Scandinavia. And, and Islamic, uh, so-called Muslim-dominated countries are number 30. Malaysia, oh, and Saudi Arabia is number 70 or something. Okay, but Malaysia number 30, but the first no Muslim countries. This is using the so-called Islamic value system. Maybe you should get that uh, that uh, report. It's about social economic things, and I think that is very essential because that is architecture. Architecture is not from a book that has buildings. And when I see my PhD student go buy books of architecture, I say this is the wrong book. You know, 
know, you don't buy those books anymore. I want to be undergraduate and, 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 and uh, maybe master student will have to buy some of these books, but for PhD, you have to do other books, philosophy, history, social science. Then only we can have meaning. Okay? Architecture does not come from architecture. Okay? So, uh, that is my ideas. Uh, I hope that uh, maybe that uh, some of it can be used in, in relation to constructing what is called the principles of uh, the Islamic city and architecture. Thank you very much. Uh, they don't move around, 
uh, you see from Sp uh, Dr. Smahid, for example, explained this and uh, he actually explained it from the idea of uh, Ibn Khaldun, uh, who is known to be a scholar in civilization, especially on uh, Islamic civilization. Uh, and, uh, and we say that the, that the city uh, developed from there, but uh, a city cannot be just a place where people congregate and there is no actually community values within it. So a city must have some sort of community values. Now the value to me is related to the idea of having a soul. You see, the, you see the, is, is, is the inner part of it. And that's why I think in, uh, in Islam, uh, planning a city is very much an, uh, an what do you call it, an introversion activity. A, uh, an, an activity that looks inside rather than looks outside. So the term introversion is a very important term. Uh, so we, uh, we we saw what uh, what presented this morning. Uh, I, I don't want to actually use your presentation as my presentation, but but uh, I get very interested in your presentation. The fact that you know uh, that when we say city, when we say architecture, people talk about uh, the forms, about topology that you are saying. So people don't actually see what is the meaning of it. The, the thing that is inside it, what does it represent, what symbolizes it. So, uh, so when you talk about introversion, you talk about the idea of, of, uh, of what actually uh, it represents and uh, what it actually uh, sort of, uh, uh, what picture it gives about the real you, the real you. So that's why I, I said, when we talk about uh, Islamic city, and I don't want to define what Islam is and all the other things, but I think it's the whole thing that I assume that you know and we don't have time to do it this morning. So, uh, so soul is, uh, the soul of a city is the essence that makes it heart beat, <laughs> and to make uh, a life its entirety. So to me, a city, an Islamic city, is a city with a soul, and the soul makes that city function as it's supposed to be. Uh, meaning that uh, when, when you have a, a city, there are values to it. There are values that are defined in different ways, at different levels. Uh, at the city level, at the community level, and at individual level. All right? Now, uh, and it determines whether it is a city of compassion or it is just a hollow that is uh, inhibited by faceless human being. Now, it can be, uh, we, 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 you see the social, uh, the Western sociology always define uh, people uh, living in city as people who are impersonal. That means you don't even know who your neighbor are. You know, and sometimes, especially, you, you know only the immediate neighbor, and even then, you have a problem with your immediate neighbor. You know, I'm now the Tobatin in my area. Uh, you know, the meaning of Tobatin. I hope my friend from Indonesia know what is Tobatin. You know what is Tobatin? No, Tobatin is like, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Indonesia, they call this... Dukun. Huh? Dukun. Macam Pengulu lah. Pengulu. I move into a new area now. And, uh, and uh, for some reason, uh, they, they just, uh, what do you call it, uh, put me there as, uh, as their leader uh, of the community. Uh, and I actually purposely did not attend the meeting because I, I, I didn't want to be elected. But any, whatever it is, so I've been elected so I could do the, the thing. So, uh, so what, what I was saying is that... Uh, you as a, as a community, uh, there are there are certain things that that uh, the function of the community is now, uh, and uh, there are certain things that are function of the of individuals. But they are also a higher level than that, which is the city. So, uh, so at the end of the day, uh, the the what you call it the, the hierarchy, uh, not really the hierarchy, but rather the flow of uh, responsibility. Uh, can be seen at various uh, various level, and uh, now uh, we are talking about even the basic thing which we normally didn't do at one time because the community was very strong at one time. We were not worried about our children. Uh, many of you don't have children anymore. Right? Uh, 
uh, we are not worried about our children running around in the, in, this, uh, in, the uh, you know, in front of the house or uh, on the roadside or on the road even. Uh, because we know that each member of the community will be looking after our, our children, I see. Uh, but nowadays, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very scary situation, you know. <laughs> even, uh, even your children uh, in the playground, which is supposed to be safe, is not safe now. You know, you have to, people have to be there all the time and uh, watch their children. You know, even in shopping centers, you can... Uh, uh, some fear that uh, the children uh, get lost or uh, you know somehow and even not just children but there are other people that get lost and all these sort of things so where is our compassion and and uh, for example even we have a uh, situation where uh, all people are living on their own nowadays they see the the community has changed at one time people were living together with the children so when you grow old you are not really that worried because your children look after you or your children is close by, but now your children probably is uh, in Kota Baru where well, you are living here in, uh, in, in Kuala Lumpur. And my child, uh, is uh, my son is now staying in Sarawak, you know. So you can imagine that you are actually totally dependent on your neighbors, on your neighbors. So if you don't have compassion uh, between neighbors, then it's going to have to be a problem. But we have to live with the situation. So how do we actually change uh, our lifestyle in such a way that instead of depending on on the primary uh, family, we are now depending on the on the neighbors and all that. So uh, this is what I, as a as a Tobatin, as a I said Tobatin because next to our area where I'm staying, there is a big or asli settlement. <laughs> big or asli settlement. Uh, it's one of the biggest in Selangor, you know, in uh, in, in Rawang. Uh, and they have the Tobatin, so I style myself as Tobatin, lah. All right? No, it's, it's nothing, nothing, nothing really funny about that. Uh, okay, now, uh, where is it? Oh. oh, we are still here. Okay. So vision is the visualization of the future. How do we actually visualize the, the future for as far as the uh, Islamic city is concerned. Now, uh, we have heard what uh, the, the views are from the there. Uh, so, uh, and, and we, have, we have also some understanding of what, uh, is, uh, what we think is the, uh, the ideal uh, situation of, uh, of uh, an Islamic uh, society. Uh, I hope you don't mind me sitting like this, you know. Uh, I, I'm having some, some problem. <laughs> okay. Now, anyway, so a vision is, a, is actually a visualization of your hope and dream. Now, the idea of what, what, what you hope the city would be, and I, and I, and I was very happy when uh, Dr. Yazid said that uh, we, you want to draw up what should be, uh, what would be uh, an Islamic city for Malaysia. To reconstruct, yeah, that's the word you are saying, right? Reconstruct, reconstruct. So how do we actually reconstruct that, you know? When we say reconstruct, we can actually mean uh, uh, rebuilding what has been there, or what we, are, we may also mean is that we are actually building something else uh, from the, the, the uh, what do you call it, rudiments uh, that we have, right? So, I don't know where we are at the moment, but I'm certainly from uh, listening to Prof. Julian, we are, we, we are not there yet. See? So, so maybe what you are trying to say is that uh, maybe we, have, we can have a better city that reflect uh, what is an Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic city uh, for Malaysia. But that would be a real challenge, right? Because uh, we are a multiracial country. Uh, and uh, many people has the uh, idea that uh, Islamic city is, a, is about uh, about uh, translating the, what are in the Muslim mind, and I don't think that should be right. I think it should reflect uh, the Islamic cities, should reflect the, the, the dream and the hope of everybody here in Malaysia. I think that's, that's important. Now, uh, that's the beautiful case uh, 
induce a <laughs> view that we have. Uh, this is the view that we have to live with, right? But there's something that looks there. Uh, so we, we suddenly say, okay, uh, we need a city that is uh, the project us to the rest of the world, All right? So we must have what the, the others have. So we first is we must have the tower. In order to be like, uh, like the other cities, uh, the, uh, like Paris, you know, I think some of you are probably my Facebook friends, right? So one day my uh, rector said that uh, as an academician, we have to publish or to perish. So I said, I'm going to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> And many people say, yeah, from enjoy it. <laughs> I don't know what the answer the reaction was. <laughs> so there you go. I say, we, we say okay, uh, they have the Apple Tower. When Apple Tower start, uh, first uh, was developed, the uh, British said it was the most horrible building in, uh, that can ever be imagined by human being. All right? So and, and there's, they wrote so many things about it, uh, how difficult and how ugly it was and whatever. And then suddenly they fell in love with it, or rather they, they were, became jealous of it, and they designed so many things, so and they, uh, they, they came up with something. Uh, so, but, but we have our own, alhamdulillah, we have our own uh, KL Tower, <laughs> like <laughs> Tokyo Tower. And we said it must look, uh, it must project an Islamic uh, image. So, okay, so I think from uh, Dr. Masur can say something about it. I should be quite the same as that. It's a very important man like our, our uh, uh, chairman. And then we have our 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 twin tower because we know very well that many people can build twin building, twin towers, so we build twin towers here yeah, the Alright. Now uh, so uh, so does that make us into a Kolonopo into, or, or rather is now going to be an Islamic city. Uh, I don't know. You, we, we have to answer that together. You know, I'm not going to be giving you the answer all right, because this is a discussion uh, or rather a uh, 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 sharing in a uh, situation. All right? Does that thing actually, and many other things that's been done uh, turning us into the Islamic city. I remember when uh, when uh, the architects, what was his name, uh, Norman, the, the one that built the, uh, the, uh, the Sultan of the Samad building, yeah, as he is he Norman, right? And he, he actually originally designed the buildings around the Padang uh, as uh, with Renaissance architecture. And then uh, Frank, uh, uh, Frank Swettenham, who happened to be the first uh, uh, resident general, or yeah, at that time of the street of the hereditary uh, place state, said that uh, you must remember that we are actually uh, ruling this country on behalf of the Malay rulers. Almost. So he changed the design to something that he said that reflect uh, reflect uh, what they call it uh, uh, Islam. And the only model that they had at that time was, of course, the, the Mughal model. So they brought the Mughal model because the British actually ruled India, the Mughal India, they replaced the Mughal and they ruled India. And they, and they saw the building that was used by the Muslims in India and brought it to, to Malaysia. And that's, that's what our first uh, sort of uh, so-called uh, uh, building that reflect uh, Islam uh, in a sense, all right, and uh, and of course uh, at the end they build the the, uh, the what do you call it the, uh, the church uh, in the corner of the corner of the, building, uh, of the place. But generally speaking, that was their idea. The idea was that uh, they said it must reflect the society that we are in. Now, what? Why did he not choose the Malay? Building the time. That's for Dr. Master Masin. <laughs> I'm always giving people work, you know, this I, you know me better. That's what I do. Alright, so so uh, this so-called vision 2020 that we had, uh, see they, they're talking about the environment and all this sort of thing. I, I, I don't know. So at the end of the day, a city with a soul is a city that is planned.
to be a place where people realize the meaning of their being. Uh, this is my own definition, the meaning of their own, uh, of their being. What is the meaning of their being? Uh, for a Muslim, it's very simple. We refer back to the Quran. Uh, Prof. Judin mentioned about the primary sources and the primary sources, the best primary sources of the Quran. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we created men and jinns for nothing else but to worship us, to, to, to actually worship us. Okay, so the meaning of our beings. Uh, all right, now the fundamental objective in the creation, uh, in their creation, uh, in their moment, in the transaction with their fellow men and their amanah to stewarding the, the environment. All right. Now, this is a beautiful view, uh, aerial view of, uh, of uh, Kota Baru uh, at the time of, uh, I think this is the rainy season when they have uh, probably flood. Uh, and, but Kota Baru is interestingly, it has styled itself as Kota Baru Bandaraya Islam. All right. That is something that we need to discuss also. So, uh, Dr. Yatid now, yes, he's, uh, he's missing. Uh, never mind. Uh, and the group are now talking away. Where's Dr. Yatid? No, it's not wrong. Okay, never mind. Now, uh, and Dr. Atia also, they, 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 are talk, they are talking about developing a, a model for an Islamic state. My Kota Baru has already styled itself as Bandaraya Islam. Bandaraya is a city. Now, but whether it is the one, the, the type of city that we actually really call, so you must, you must have, I assume you must have not agreed with that. <laughs> and there must be a reason why you don't agree, and that's why you need to, 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 to do it again. Okay? Kalau tak, you would go to Kota Baru and just, just uh, look at what Kota Baru have, and then uh, probably duplicate that somewhere else. <laughs> I think our friend from Malang probably know this. This is Bandar Aceh. Uh, Bandar Aceh is also another interesting city because it is uh, the capital of a uh, province in Indonesia, which uh, we say Aceh Negara Islam. Negara Islam. All right. So, uh, so we, so this uh, to me, uh, we, as I said in the beginning, we may not agree with what old people say or what individual people say. But there are things that we can learn from them, you know. Uh, and uh, as uh, uh, if if uh, they made mistake, then uh, we 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 learn to avoid the mistake. If they're good, then we learn how to make the, the good better. All right. Uh, there is a, a proverb. I think it's an Arab proverb. We say that only the donkey fall into the same hole twice. So we don't we don't uh, actually fall into the same hole twice by learning from what are wrong and uh, what other people are doing. All right? Now, uh, and then, uh, this is the image that, that is in everybody's mind about what Aceh is. And uh, I think from, uh, Dr. Masto has a problem with this. <laughs> but as if now, there's another example. Uh, another example. I'm trying to bring example first before I go into Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. City that I think we can look into. And uh, you see, uh, this is because Brunei is uh, another state that style itself as, uh, what do you call it? Darussalam? Brunei? Brunei? Huh? Uh, yes, yeah, something to do with Islam. <laughs> so it has a. You see what? You see this is a, this is the the the, the mosque uh, in the center here. You have the town center, and then you have people who are living in traditional way, which are the the built over 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 the water, right? And when they build new houses, they also build over the water. You see this? Except that the layout are modern. They are like uh, like what we have here when we build our our terrace houses and whatever, except that they are built over water. You know? They are all over the place in Brunei. I'm quite sure many of you have been to Brunei. Uh, you see this this thing. I was I, I find it quite quite difficult to 
to understand, you know, because they have a big land, uh, but they still build this thing over the water. And uh, I don't know, last time it was probably because because they have boats and whatever, but this is one way of probably uh, probably sort of uh, continuing the culture that they have. All right, so this is, uh, you see this? This is that mosque just now, uh, in the water, and you have this, uh, this uh, road around it. And then you have these houses, the houses of the people, they are actually in the water, you know, traditional in the water, but now it's almost filled up, almost filled up. Uh, and, but they still have these, these houses. So they are like a very contrasting situation. You have uh, this dome, great mosque. You have this, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, ship-like thing. And, uh, and, thing. And, then, and then you have these people living here. So we need to, we need to ask ourselves, what, is, uh, what, what does that actually mean uh, in our society? You know? Right. Okay. Now uh, this is another city that uh, I went to, and uh, this is uh, this is actually Madina Fest. It was founded in seven uh, eight nine uh, AD by Idris the first. And Idris the first, I think many of you know, he's the grandson of uh, yeah, I think he's the grandson of uh, Sayyidina Ali. Uh, no, the, the son, uh, grandson of Sina Hassan, uh, who is the son of Sina, so great grandson. He said, "When I found, uh, I found this city, Allah said that your name will be supplicated within its wall." Uh, what does it mean? It means that he said that this city is a, is a city for the Muslims, uh, where he 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 has visualized, he has envisioned rather than visualized, envisioned that the people who are living here are people who are actually uh, practicing uh, who, are, who, who are adherents to Islam as a religion. Okay? So, uh, and uh, of course, I think anybody from Sarawak? This is my home, uh, my, where I come from. You know? People say, Apa, apa bantu nanti hati ya? I say, sayang Sarawak, suka je sempit. Uh, buah perangan, lambung-lambungan. Uh, apa lagi? Anda aku tinggal, uh, anda aku bawa perahu aku sempit. Anda aku tinggal, apa? tinggal aku buat, tinggal jajungan. Something like that. Okay, anyway. But here is for a different thing. I just want to put that as a, as a photograph. Uh, now, you see here, quoted by Ali Safa Ibn Mosul said that uh, do not stop in a place that does not have a sultan or a ruler. Yeah, a ruler. An active marketplace and a running water. It's very simple. What do you call it? Uh, description, if not definition, of what an Islam, Islamic uh, city is. I see. There are three important things here. One is a rule of meaning that there must be a rule of law. A rule of law that applies to everybody. You know, everybody submit to that rule of law, uh, and, uh, and and that rule of law applies to to all people. So. The, how the law is being interpreted is by the ruler that is in place. Meaning that uh, if it is a situation, uh, they have to invent or they have to create certain uh, certain tools or rather uh, arms of the government that can actually make sure that everybody feels safe. Nobody is a victim of any anybody else. Okay. So it means that if you are actually uh, uh, living there, you are protected by the same law, the same rule of law, okay? And then the active marketplace. Active marketplace means a place where trans transaction is, uh, whether it's uh, by the people inside the area or by people that come from outside and whatever, and they're protected by the law, and there's certain regulation to it. And the, the market is an active uh, active place where it serves many purposes other than for for uh, buying and selling. It also serves as the purpose of meeting place and whatever, all right? And the running water represents clean environment. It represents clean environment. So the city is a place that has a rule of law and it has a, a, a place for transaction or relationship between uh, people. And then it is a place which has a, a clean environment. Because running water is a clean environment. So, so uh, in the Khadun, of course, say that uh, the, this, uh, this, what was touched by from touch, uh, I tell you, didn't, I am not going to 
discuss very much on it. But whatever it is, the city is a seat of crowds, science, art, and culture are located. So a city is not only just a collection of buildings, it not, it's not just a collection of, uh, of people, but it's also the seat of crafts. Now, when you say about crafts, you're talking about people with knowledge, people with skill. Otherwise, there will not be uh, this craft. So the idea that the people there are people of, of, of higher level, people that, that do have uh, a certain uh, skill that can make the thing, you don't just build, uh, uh, what you call it, the uh, made the craft for just for yourself, uh, but it is also for for you to transact with other people. And the science is also a science. You see the, the idea that it is the seed of knowledge, of course, and arts and also culture. This, uh, I think, this you have seen this many times. Uh, a city that provides uh, its people. I know how to do this guy. Uh, I don't know. That's what he, everybody trying to be. Uh, he said that a city is a place which is secure. Now we have to put gates in, in our housing area. You know, in my area we have to we have to hire the the, the guards ourselves. Uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Zaidi went to my place and he saw his guard. I hate having living in this place. And so, uh, but but you cannot run away. I was in Sri Goma before, I was enjoying myself, a free society, we were living together. Then suddenly they put the gates. They put the gates and I had to be. So I ran away to Barawang, I thought I was safe, and then they put the gates. And I went to my daughter's place in Kuantan, and before long, the gates were open. People were not feeling really safe. Really safe. How do we make the city safe? All right? Security. And then safety. Uh, kita orang Melayu ni dua-dua keselamatan Dua-dua keselamatan Tapi in English, there are two different things Security and safety Safety ni like tadi lah Macam the design of places that must be safe uh, It's not just uh, just beautiful But it must also be safe uh, And then uh, and then we say healthcare Healthcare now, now that I'm getting to this age I really appreciate the idea of a place having healthcare as if you feel, uh, you, you know where to go when you are not well, and, uh, and that uh, things are, are, are within your reach, okay? Then hygiene. Now, when we talk about Kota Baru, at one time, uh, is that Bandara Islam, you are missing when I talk about it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's a Bandara Islam. At that time, I was at fault, because I saw all the dirty things within the city. I tak boleh makan pun. Sorry, uh, saya ni kata, Sparrow, what about that? It's a plantain. Yeah. Yeah. But after marrying a plantainist for almost 40 years now, must say, where do I? Must say, where do I? Plantain, 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 plantain. Can you understand what I'm saying? I'm using plantainist language. Uh, that language. Uh, it means that, you know, uh, I, was, I was saying that I'm very worried about the fact that they are the claiming to be an Islamic city. But the environment was very unhygienic, you know, uh, very unhygienic. Uh, and uh, while, while hygiene is one of the criteria of being a Muslim, you know, uh, being Brusi is one of the All right, now, uh, and then uh, you, have, you say, uh, they say amenity, not amenity. Amenity means uh, what people can use. Uh, from Taj was talk, uh, Tajuddin was talking about uh, wakaf and all these other public spaces, you know? And then accessibility. Accessibility, the place must be accessible. Uh, and also excellent infrastructure. We are talking about excellent infrastructure. Affordable housing. Affordable housing. Now, uh, I want to go back to this, uh, this uh, healthcare thing, just for, uh, I suddenly remembered. Uh, you see, Islam introduced what is called Bimaristan. Bimaristan is actually uh, the first uh, concept of hospital, you know, first concept of hospital. Uh, Bimaristan is not only just where people go for healing, but it's also the place where, uh, where people go for, for what you call it, uh, uh, to be looked after. Look after. So when you are sick, uh, the, it is the community responsibility also to look after you. 
to look after you. Nowadays we are becoming so, so uh, what do you call it, um, uh, money oriented that uh, healthcare has suddenly become one of the one of the biggest uh, money making industry, uh, especially in Malaysia. Now, you know, it's so it's so difficult to be sick nowadays in Malaysia. You know, because uh, and 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 one day we are going to be like other people. We we are uh, dying is also a very, very expensive thing. Right. So, uh, and then uh, industry. The city must have industry. The city must have industry. Okay, and then food security. Uh, this is the situation. Our city, I don't know whether we do have any place for planting anything. Uh, but food security is very important for a city to survive. You see? Uh, there was a time, I think many years ago, a uh, few years ago, when uh, there was a problem with uh, supply of rice in Malaysia. And suddenly we realized that, you know, we are so dependent on the ties, you know, and with the ties are holding us by the neck and, uh, and deciding what are the price that we should pay for, for, for rice. Kita, kita ni tidak fikir kita tahu kan, because we turn everything that we have into oil palm. We cannot eat oil palm. Nowadays, even in, uh, people burn their forest so, for just to plant more oil palm. So uh, this is just a city that I think you, all of you know. Uh, this is uh, uh, Cordoba, uh, and uh, this is the Great Mosque of Cordoba. Uh, and you see the the uh, if you talk about technology, you are talking about uh, buildings uh, and houses that are that separate uh, that that spread from not separate, separate from from the from the, the mosque. All right. This is what we have as a vision of a of a, a city. Uh, of course, I think you know this. Some people say, make uh, some remark and say that uh, they, they build the, 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 the river in order to have the bridge. Uh, don't quote me on that one. It's very dangerous now. <laughs> so small, you have to find You see what other people are doing? They turn the, the highway. And take and make the river again. There, there was a river here. Then somebody decided to build a highway, and then they build the river again, and then they reclaim it. Now it becomes totally a, a river plus the the linear park for people. This is in 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 in. It's free. What happened? Okay. Uh, become a linear park in the. So. Let me something wrong. Okay. Then what? Uh, but this is what we have. <laughs> this is what we have. This is, unfortunately, you know, this is one of the most, what do you call it, the, the most historical part of the city. Every talk, everybody talk about Kuala Lumpur as being this plane, the founding of Kuala Lumpur, and the confluence, Kuala mean the confluence of these two rivers, the Klang River and the Gomba River. And we have turned it, managed to turn it into a huge monsoon drain. A huge monsoon drain. And we have this, you see this thing? There are times during the day, if you are here at this, uh, at this uh, LRT station, you can see the, the dirty water being flushed up into the river. SubhanAllah, <laughs> how we actually treat our environment, you know, how we treat our environment. I think I'm saying this in a negative way, but I hope that uh, Dr. Yazid and his group will see the positive way how to do this. All right? Because it's so easy to criticize, you know. <laughs> All right. So a city is an inclusive, uh, is inclusive actually, it's for everybody. The respect for the rights of the neighbors as basis for, for uh, neighborhood planning. We have neighborhood planning. Uh, how can I get to that one? <coughs> All right. You see, we have, uh, these are the rights of our neighbors. We have to greet them. Uh, in Islamic greeting, it doesn't mean that we are, we are saying only Islam alaikum. We can say nice thing to them. All right? Uh, visit him when he's unwell. Uh, offer him condolences and help in time of calamity when he is in, in, in trouble, when he has problems. Okay, offer him congratulations at time of his joys when he's 
he has a new son, for example, or a new baby. And then as much as possible to overlook his mistake. Kita ni kalau ada salah, ayat tu lah kita nak kawin. Uh, kawan ni kan? Macam-macam kita kata. You know? So, we have real problem there. You know? And then, uh, and, uh, and give him gifts wherever it's possible. Di balik kampung, durian pun nak sembunyi. Bawa hanya durian bau. Kan? Di balik bunyi, sembunyi. Tapi kita masuk buat durian sebenarnya berbosu. Kan? Apa salah bagikan mereka sebiji? Kan? Sampai kan? Sebab durian mahal. Kan? Eh, ada yang nak, nak sembunyi buah kuih ni pun nak bunyi. Mana boleh? Dia bau, bau kuat. Kan? Now, Uh, have him financially if he if if he needs uh, financial help if we have the money to do it or, or we can help him to find somebody that can help him if we don't have the, the way to help him ourselves. Do not look at his possession with MP kita tengok orang ini yang masalah apa orang sebelah tiba tiba je tukar tirai. Ah ini bang bang lagi lama tukar tirai kan. Sekarang ni orang sebelah tu dia pakai apa ni TV berapa berapa inci lah lah bang tu. Kawan pun, hasbun pun tension semacam. Eh, cuba mati. Eh, kan? Tak ada. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we have guide him, and that will bring him benefit in both his uh, religious and worldly affairs. Okay. Now, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, that's the wrong one. How do I get that? Okay. Now there should be empathy. Uh, with the compassion and less fortunate but of people with disabilities. Now, when we design the, mas the, the cities, we must try. I'm doing this for the, for the, for the, for the country now, for, the whole of the, uh, for Malaysia, to do audits of our public spaces. How much of our public spaces are actually accessible to people with, all, with many types of disability? Uh, people on wheelchair, people on crutches, people on uh, uh, having so, uh, so many types of uh, disability. And the worst thing is we have problem with even designing for, I think the most difficult one is to design people with uh, deaf, uh, who are deaf, who, are, who cannot hear. Uh, they look very handsome. They walk like you, but they cross the road and you, you langgar ke kereta. Because he cannot listen to your car, you know, because he cannot. So it's a very difficult situation to be in. So there's a challenge for all of us. But all of us are going to be disabled, especially the ladies. Once they get pregnant, they are disabled. They are disabled. In some way, they are disabled. Okay? All of us, uh, people as handsome as Dr. Mastro is going to be disabled because he's getting old. Okay. One of these days, he cannot move as fast as he is now. Pakai macam mana pun, he will not move. He will not move that, that, that well. Okay? So we have to design. An Islamic city must be a city with compassion. It must be designed to look after this type of thing. So we must have a, uh, we must be understanding of this. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So what would be uh, the three characteristics of a city? All right. Now, uh, where is it? All right. Okay. We we talk about from Islamic point of view. We talk about our our our, our belief. Our belief, okay. Uh, but some people don't like the symbol, but I use it just for the purpose of uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, recognition. All right. We talk about for humankind to remove harms and hardship. For example, good housing, good education, and permit allowable trade and enterprise to improve the, the life of the citizen. So the city is for the planner and the architect to actually. Keep the opportunity. We don't do it ourselves. You see, we don't do it ourselves. We don't go around and, and, and do it for other people. But we keep opportunity. That's why we are called planners. We give op our opportunity for people to improve themselves and to also remove harms and hardship from them. Like for example, people who had problems with, with, uh, with their lives. So maybe they can find jobs uh, in the city. Or they can uh, or do all sorts of things that make them a better, better person in terms of their livelihood. So, uh, so we talk about other spaces. What are the spaces that are in the cities? And then we talk about justice within the cities. With justice, not only means justice in terms of uh, 
of uh, of justice and as in the mahkamah in the court, but justice toward each other. You know, I think this afternoon, uh, Doctor uh, from uh, Zaini is going to talk about adab. That's actually what I actually mean. Eliminating our prejudices. You know, I have problem with this because I'm trying to my best to actually uh, bring the various races in my area to actually congregate in one place during certain time of the, but the only place that we have are the open space in Brad or Surah. And some people also have problem with that because they say, oh, they got Surah, they talk about the town. Yeah. And problem also with the Malaysia, oh, they didn't need the town. Okay, it's not true. From the Jubilee country. Okay, it's not true. So, uh, this is problem with us. Yeah. And then, uh, and then elevating hardship. Hardship. How do we elevate hardship? Uh, is actually by providing them with opportunities for income. You know, how to make uh, better income for themselves. Alright? Uh, ini kalau mencuri dekat masjid, kita, apa ni, uh, penjara 2 tahun. <laughs> Kawan tu anak terkuat-kuat ke rumah, apa ni, nangis, tak, tak ada susu. So he has nothing else, he has no other sources to do. To do. He go to the masjid, try to correct duit daripada, daripada tabung. And the next thing we know is in the in the in the prison, you know. And we say, "Yeah, the book told it. Apa hal? Tadi tu balai kena cumi. Come on, Jin. Kita kita tengok wah itu. Then we we look that one. All right. So we're talking about life. We're talking about lineage. Lineage. This is Makassar, uh, Australia. You are talking about the lineage of people. You see, we protect. The, the our continuity of the the life, right? We talk about the mind, our heart. We talk about resources, how to use resources properly, and and adil is actually one of the thing about adil is how to use the resources uh, in the proper manner. We talk about intellect. We talk about intergenerational. I mean, the idea that uh, there is. You see, in the West, they talk about generational gap. But Islam talk about intergenerational, meaning that we talk about how to connect one generation to another generation. All right, uh, and uh, and we talk about the whole world. This is our our uh, responsibility. Uh, maybe I'm just too too too, too slow. Okay. Uh, all right. Maybe I should go faster. Hey, that's too fast. <laughs> what is it now? Okay. So it is a city planning in the spirit of uh, Ikra, uh, that's why I've seen it. Because we learn, sorry sir, we learn by observing and learning from natural phenomena and the past to chart. He did mention about Mekah and Madinah. It used to be a multiracial city. A multiracial city during Prophet time. And what happened now is something different. My question is, what is your comment, both of you, on, on that particular issue? I mean, Mekah and Madinah used to be a multiracial city, and nowadays it turns something not multiracial. So, based on your, your knowledge, is, is it an Islamic or whatever? But what is your, your opinion on current uh, situation in Mekah and Madinah city? in terms of Islamic values. Uh, second is a suggestion, basically. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when we talk about Islamic city, uh, the, the, the presentations uh, revolved around, uh, uh, I mean, the, the situation of, of Islamic cities in, in peaceful condition. But nowadays, when we talk about Islamic cities, especially in Muslim cities, we have uh, Muslim, uh, I mean Muslim cities uh, like Palestine and uh, Shia, which is not in peaceful condition. Perhaps my suggestion, when we talk about Islamic city in future, there is a, a, a certain part where we, we can we can perhaps evaluate how far can you adopt Islamic values in Islamic city during the war condition. Because some of the ideas has, have been discussed by non-Muslim scholars. Talking about foreign city by 
Elia Rizman from Goldsmith University research on Palestine. But there, there, there are limited studies conducted by Muslim scholars talking about Islamic values during the war condition. And, and it's undeniable. Muslim, we are currently in a situation where the Muslim are in a war situation in a Muslim city. So that's the, my, my second suggestion. Another shot for the question? Maybe another two questions? Is it Nasir? I think it's Nasir speak loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> Functionality of the city uh, in the top of the hierarchy, in, uh, or the Islamic, um, uh, or, or just just being Islamic, or just being suitable for Muslims. The functionality of the city is something different. For example, um, uh, suitable design for roads and uh, locations of the uh, every, everything, location of the residential buildings, uh, commercial buildings. This is the functionality of the city that everybody can use the city and understanding would be very easy, understandable for everybody. And the uh, meaning of the Islamic city is something else. Uh, do you think that it's better to think more about the functionality at first or think about to be Islamic city? So, so you're asking whether it's possible? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I don't think it was clear. If it was not, I can explain more. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for all the questions. Uh, the, uh, I, might, I might forget, though you remind me. Uh, the first question is about the Medina and, and Mecca. Uh, I think probably our eminent scholar over here can shed much more light on the historical aspect and the present aspect, things like that. 
uh, what I know about that issue about multiculturalism or multiracialism and the, the, the point about history and how it was first rate uh, multiracial and then it's not perhaps Dr. Ismail will answer. But to my mind, the issue about, let's say, Medina being a more homogeneous uh, Muslim now rather than maybe in the past, uh, is something to do with the, again, the question of the, the functionality. And also in mosque architecture, I always remind uh, uh, the students that there are two kinds of mosques, many, maybe many kinds of mosques, but, but basically the two kinds. One is the sacred mosque, okay? And the other is the community mosque. Now, of course, community mosque then transfer into state mosques, community mosques, and other mosques, institutional mosques, and stuff like that. But all of them can be generally said to be either community mosque or sacred mosque. Now, sacred mosque is like the, uh, it's stated in the hadith of the Prophet that the uh, Masjid al-Haram, uh, Masjid al-Nabawi, and also uh, uh, the other one in Jerusalem, yeah, uh, yeah Al-Aqsa, because it says that if you pray there, then you have uh, different rewards uh, in, in, in it. You, you cannot do that, however expensive the mosque in Putrajaya is, you still get one, one point if you, you pray alone, okay? So uh, it's different, but many people tend to think, oh, then, you know, non-Muslims cannot come into mosques and this like that. I said, you are, you are differentiating between, the, 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 you're, not, you're not understanding that there are sacred mosques and there are community mosques. So in, in Masjid al-Haram and all these other mosques, then, then the, the thing applies that non-Muslims, uh, sorry, in Masjid al-Haram, they cannot enter. Now, with regard to Medina, uh, the same thing about non-Muslims in the city, I think, has nothing to do with religion. I think it has something to do with the functionality of you know millions of of, uh, of the uh, pilgrims coming and things like that. So naturally, it evolved into, into something like that. So uh, it's not saying that it, it is ethnic cleansing or, or something uh, similar to that line, like pushing away all the other faith and so that uh, just leave only Muslims there. But I think it's more in relation to uh, the idea of it being. Uh, part of the Umrah and pilgrimage uh, route and things like that. So, so that's where the business come, comes in. Okay, that's the first part. The second part is about the uh, whether you should build Islamic cities and and and, and uh, the rest of it. Uh, saying that okay, this is Islamic city, this is not Islamic city. Uh, again, as academics, um, I, I advise my my students to say that. Um, Labeling and uh, giving names to concepts and things like that is, is, is a necessary part of academia. If not, you cannot um, have a discourse. Modern architecture, late modern architecture, postmodern architecture, expressionist, deconstructivist, these are the names. But the scholar knows that the names are a trap in themselves. So you are not a scholar until you know uh, that uh, what you are talking about has a lot of limitation. So in certain time, you will use these words. But when you are uh, in front of a student doing another topic that will uh, have a different light, then, then you will take another position. So point is about names, okay? Now when you say Islamic city, again, uh, we don't have to have Islamic city. As long as we live together and live in a manner in which the values that have been imposed that has been given to us or uh, being uh, led us to be responsible for, uh, then you will have the Islamic state. Now the problem here is that the term itself then has other images and connotations. And that's why you have to understand all this populist notion, things like that. And when you talk to a mentri, you have to use a different language. When you talk to a group of students, undergraduate, you have a different kind of language. When you talk to postgraduate students, you have a different kind of language. So in essence, yes, you don't have to have an Islamic city, but the point here is all about the values, okay? I, I don't really care whether people call me a good Muslim or not Muslim. All I, I am interested is to be a person that is good, okay? And, and so whether you call me a good Muslim or not, that's, that's not important to me. Uh, this is the same thing about, oh, he's a great professor, a great scholar. No. What, what are the, 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 the values of scholarship? that I live by, and that is, that is important. So I think that is in, in, in more or less uh, uh, the, the, the questions in general relating to that. Finally, 
the idea about uh, infrastructure, you know, functionality, uh, and, and things like uh, uh, when Le Corbusier says about uh, we have to uh, look at the house houses, eh? housing houses as machine for living in. It doesn't mean look like a machine. <laughs> it means you have to to uh, examine how we live now and what we have uh, in terms of uh, society and environment and this and that. Then we design. Do not follow tradition for tradition's sake. Okay, because we live terrace house like this, we we plan terrace house like this. So now we design almost the same planning, almost the same terrace house. But uh, different color, different this and different that. That's that's not a machine for living in. And number one, machine for living in is not looking like a machine, but it is actually re-examining uh, what it is that is required. Similarly, with the mosque, okay, the, the, the mosque it is necessary for you to examine it, re-examine uh, the mosque in light of the needs and requirements of the times. Same thing with the city. What is the need? What is the requirement? So you cannot actually run away from that. That is the fundamental uh, aspect that you have to do. Now, of course, when you have a, a, a leadership, eh? a leadership that imposes and says, look, I want to look grand when I walk into my prime minister department. Now, that, that, that comes the, the, the problem. But of course, being a practicing planner or architect, you will have to weave your way through it. But most architects and planners say the client pays, therefore give what they want. I don't know about that. Lah. But the, the point here is that you should advise the Prime Minister and say that, well, we should, uh, this is an outmoded idea and you will be looked upon as an authoritarian if you design cities like this. But if you design it like this, then you will look upon as part of the people and part of this all. Oh, then you can win more votes and be uh, a dulu, kini dan selamanya, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the government, government, something like that. So, uh, yes, obviously, no two ways about it, the functionality. But functionality must also be based on certain, certain other ideas, not just basic function like when uh, Ms. Mendero defined it. He says that, well, it's just, you know, you, you can eat, you can sleep, and you can go to the bathroom. That, that's about it. There, there are many other functions that, that uh, many uh, people, or especially the early modernists, did not consider as function because they negated the idea of culture. They negated the idea of history. They negated the idea of, of spirituality in a sense of what it has been defined as tradition. So, in some sense, they, they, they did that and then they come up, come up with this kind of buildings. Okay? But we, can, we have to look at the, the value that they have put, re-examination. But then, their examination is based on certain idea that perhaps not akin to what we uh, uh, want to have. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, no, uh, I think I'll go back to your question, the first question. You see, this is a problem of, um, what do I call it, when you talk about Makkah and Madinah as being exclusively for, uh, uh, for Muslims, uh, and it used to be multiracial at one time. Uh, of course, uh, if you look at the history on the surface of it, uh, that's what you would probably understand. You see, the idea that, uh, that, uh, that uh, what do you call it, uh, that it used to be multiracial, uh, I don't think the word multiracial is the is the correct word uh, because uh, Makkah used to attract. It is a center even before Islam, before Muhammad was center for all the Arabs. So it's not uh, not multiracial, but more more in terms of the Arabs, all the Arabs, you know. Uh, and uh, but it only changed uh, when uh, Islam was there, meaning that. Uh, they are still Arabs. They are still the same race of people, because the Arabs have been defined by uh, language rather than uh, being ethnicity. You know, so as long as you speak the Arab language, the Arabic language, you are Arab, right? Like for example, the Sudanese, they look as black as anything. I'm sorry, uh, and and you can see the the uh, the other Arabs. They look as white as the uh, Aleppo, for example, the Syrian. They look as white as uh, even whiter than the uh, European, you know. So they have this translation. But they are all Arabs by definition of the language of Arabs. 
Uh, but not. But but you will find the difference when you start talking about religion. Uh, see, so religion start to be uh, be different. Meaning that. Yes, uh, dari pengisi majelis para profesor pengentang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Saya akan membentangkan atas video saya dalam bahasa saya ya. e, Kepada sesiapa fotos Who not really understand Please, please learn to understand e, My know e, Who coming from Iran Iran from Arabic speaking country. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, terima kasih. Actually, for those uh, who are coming from Iran, actually we are sharing about 400 words. Yeah, 400 words. You are sharing. Actually, you can understand some terminology, some words that I'm talking about. For Arab country, actually you are sharing about 1,600 words. Yeah? Uh, so, I think uh, most of you can easily understand, but the important thing you need to understand which sort of, the sort of, according to the sort of, uh, you need to refer. Which one is a uh, referable to be used? Yeah? Okay? Uh, bila saya diminta untuk uh, berkongsi uh, bila doktor nak terima kasih juga kepada pihak penganjur kerana menyebut saya ya untuk uh, sebaris dengan pakai-pakai yang hebat ni lah ya so mereka ni sifu saya sebenarnya masa saya sekolah dulu ya so uh, gerut juga sebenarnya gemetar dengan si sifu ni tengok saya buat gemetangan ya ok saya, uh, saya minta maaf kerana mungkin ada Kenyataan-kenyataan uh, yang mungkin sedikit berbeza dengan yang Dr. Sifu Sifu ni tadi bentangkan yeah. uh, Bila Dr. Nam minta saya bercakap mengenai uh, falsafah mereka bentuk dan pelaksanaan yeah. Saya kata saya cuba untuk berkongsi Kemudian saya cuba untuk mencadangkan rangka pemikiran uh, Yang kita boleh pakai, kita boleh guna pakai dalam cuba untuk menghasilkan Uh, pendekatan ke arah bandar sejahtera atau bandar Islam ya. Okay. okay. So saya uh, dalam pembentangan pembentangan ini uh, saya akan merujuk kepada seni bina di arkitektur. Yeah. Okay. So sebagai muka demak sebagai. Uh, okay. Baik. Macam mana ni? Okay. Okay. Uh, saya ingin berkongsi ayat ini Bila saya uh, membuat satu-satu uh, kupasan mengenai seni bina yeah? Saya bersuka merujuk pada uh, statement kenyataan Tuhan Ta'ala melalui surah Rum ayat 22 Uh, mana, maksudnya berbunyi macam ini eh? Dan di antara tanda-tanda yang membuktikan kekuasaannya Dan kebiasaannya Ialah kejadian langit dan bumi Dan perbezaan bahasa kamu Dan warna kulit kamu Sesungguhnya yang demikian itu Mengandungi keterangan tangan Bagi orang yang berpengetahuan Kalau kita lihat Kalau kita lihat seluruh muka bumi ini Setiap kawasan Setiap kedaerahan Tak ada yang sama Tak ada yang sama ya? Di Serdang ini berbeza Dengan ada yang di Bangi Dengan seri kembangan pun berbeza Persekitarannya berbeza ya? Sebab Iklimnya berbeza Microclimate dia berbeza ya? Dengan iklim yang berbeza Dan persekitaran yang berbeza inilah uh, Manusia membangunkan 
peradaban mereka budaya mereka yang juga berbeza ya, dan kita kena terima hakikat ini kesemuanya tidak sama walaupun orang Melayu uh, ada di tanah Melayu dan orang yang Melayu ada di Sumatera, ada di Jawa di Sulawesi di Kalimantan mereka berada dalam sekitaran yang berbeza maka mereka akan membangunkan seni bina yang juga berbeza Bandar juga berbeza So inilah yang dimaksudkan sebagai identiti So bila bercakap pasal identiti Saya suka merujuk kepada satu ayat lagi ya, Ahal Ujerat ayat 13 So inilah yang berkaitan dengan Supaya antara minta kita berkenal-kenalan Berkenal-kenalan bila kita ada perbezaan baru kita boleh berkenalan Ya, okay. So, di sini dengan ayat kedua ayat tadi Inilah sebagai hujah saya mengapa Setiap daripada kita ini perlu ada identiti Ya, ok Ini satu bangunan yang ada di Leman Sarah Nama bangunan ini Melayu kalau kita nak bercakap pasal seni bina Islam ataupun bandar Islam kan so adakah sesuai bangunan ini dipakaikan begitu mungkin sebelumnya ada yang sudah melihat bangunan ini ataupun pembentangan saya seperti ini ya yeah? nama dia Melayu tapi dipakaikan dengan baju macam macam pun lah ya yeah? so kita lihat kalau oleh saya ya yeah? saya seorang Melayu Jawa Muslim kalau okay. saya orang Jawa Ya, yeah. saya so, saya lahir di sini. Jadi saya kata saya Melayu Muslim. Kan? Pakaian yang macam mana agaknya yang sesuai untuk saya? Of course, sudah pasti tuan-tuan melihat saya berpakaian begini mungkin inilah perwatakan saya sepatutnya kan. Eh? Tapi kita lihat bagaimana agaknya baju yang sesuai digunakan oleh pakai oleh Mustu sebagai seorang Melayu Muslim. Agaknya sesuai ke tak begini? Mukanya Melayu Jawa tapi pakai dia baju macam tu. Tidur tak cukup. Tak kena eh. Eh, mau langsung tak kena. Kalau pakai macam ni. Baca. Mata tak cukup sepik, kena sepik lagi. Eh? Tak kena juga kan? Eh? Macam tu Syekh punya ni. Muslim kan? Eh? <laughs> masih tak nampak Melayunya tak nampak, tak nampak Melayunya eh? Melayu Jawa yang tak nampak macam ni lagi tak nampak lagi tak kena tengok satu lagi kena ke tak okay? macam tu lah baru kena pakai eh? <laughs> Melayu yang Melayu seorang Melayu Muslim okay? nampak kan eh? nampak perwatakan seorang Melayu Muslim inilah yang saya masukkan sebagai identiti ya yeah. ok so kalau sempat <laughs> kalau sempat mudah-mudahan sempat kalau tak sempat pun saya browse terus saja saya akan tinggalkan saya punya uh, apa powerpoint di sini untuk dikongsikan ya yeah. ok so bahagian pertama saya akan ceritakan mengenai peradaban ya yeah. sebab ini penting kita bercakap pasal sejarah, peradaban Tapi betul ke kita kenal Sapa kita sebenarnya Kita membangunkan satu kawasan Tapi kita kenal ke penduduk dia Kan Satu kawasan tu ada penghuni dia Jadi kita kenal ke tak Sapa yang kita nak bangunkan eh? okay. Yang kedua ni uh, Lebih kepada Bagian kedua lebih kepada Latar belakang permasalahan uh, Yang ni yang dia katakan krisis lah uh, Uh, Dr. Taj pun dah banyak cerita pasal krisis seni bina yeah. So yang ketiga baru barulah saya akan berkongsi okay. uh, Bagaimana uh, pendekatan, pendekatan pendekatan yang kita boleh gunakan Dalam untuk uh, uh, mencari ke arah bandar yang sejahtera yeah. Kalau kita tak nak pakai word Islam tadi katanya uh, Dah jadi Jadi apa? Kalau guna nama Islam tu rasanya macam wah uh, tak tahu nak cakap apa ya eh? sebab orang Arab pun dia tak pakai bandar Islam ya eh? uh, dia panggil uh, apa 
adalah nama-nama ni yang sesuai dengan nama bangkat Okey. Prof uh, Dr. Tas bercerita pasal nilai dan Dr. Mawi juga cerita pasal nilai tapi saya saya, saya kena raikan juga adik-adik ni yang nak tengok berkaitan dengan GC macam mana rupa dia okay. kita nak design suami kita nak cerai suami GC macam mana rupa dia yeah. ha, saya cuba kongsikan macam mana sepatutnya gaya rupa perwatakan macam ni Islam dan mungkin kita boleh gabungkan yeah. Atau objek dengan nilai ya, Kita boleh gabung dan tengok Di mana yang uh, berkenaan ya? okay. So mungkin uh, Nanti kumpulan penyelidik ni Cuba lihat Bagaimana idea-idea ini kita boleh gabungkan Antara objek dan venue okay. Saya ini tak nak cakap banyak Sebab sudah dijelaskan Sebab itu Kalun, ya, uh, ini ada Dr. Sawi lagi lagi hebat menceritakan mengenai Ibu Kaldun so uh, saya suka sebut uh, suka nak berkongsi sikit eh, mengenai tempat di mana kita tinggal ini sebab tajuknya Islamic City in Malaysia eh, di Malaysia kita nak membangunkan tanah air kita jadi kita kena tahu Uh, sebab sedikit apa dia perwatakan keperluan siapa dia yang menggunakan penduduk uh, Malaysia ini yeah. so kalau ikut UNESCO dan dikatakan uh, alam Melayu ni sebenarnya siapa yang bercakap Melayu lah suka mencukup juga, juga dia meletakkan uh, negara Arab siapa yang bercakap Arab tu ke negara Arab lah yeah. ok <coughs> kita tengok Mari kita kenal siapa dia Melayu Mungkin ramai di antara kita ni tak tahu pun kita ni siapa Orang Melayu ni datang ke mana kan Eh Tak tahu So Kalau kita tunjuk kepada bahasa Sanskrit Melayu daripada dua perkataan Malai dan Ur Eh Bermakna Apa Malai adalah gunung Ur adalah kota Ya, Malayu adalah orang yang membina kota gunungan ya, Kalau kita lihat Banyak gambaran-gambaran uh, kota gunungan Kalau orang putih panggil piramid ya, Orang putih kata piramid Orang Melayu panggil gunungan Ataupun meru Itu sebab banyak lambang-lambang Gambar-gambar yang berbentuk gunungan Pada orang Melayu termasuklah Nesta yang terbakat ya, Adalah gambar melambangkan kepada gunungan Ya So, kalau kita lihat Banyak gunungan-gunungan di dunia ini ya, Yang paling kuas sekali adalah di, Yang jumpa di pentas Sunda Di sebelah selatan Okinawa Dia sudah berumur 10 ribu tahun Itu gunungan yang terkuas setakat ini dijumpai ya, Banyak gunungan-gunungan yang lain Yang sebenarnya Dia ada menceritakan tentang Orang yang membangunkan kota gunungan ini Ya. So, persoalan dia Saya bertanya di sini, mungkinkah Semua gunungan yang ada di dunia ini Dibina oleh orang Melayu Di Di apa Piramid Di, ni, Giza Di dalam rilis Dinding, ada tulisan Mencong, maka para pengkaji Beli heran Bagaimana ada tulisan Mencong Di dalam piramid ini Tulisan Rencong adalah tulisan orang Melayu yang pertama Terawal Ya Kemudian dalam diri Merami juga Ada gambar pokok kelapa Rumah warisan Ya, saya cari di mana rumah warisan Yang dilukiskan dekat piramid Saya jumpa di Lampung Rumah di Lampung Ya Lampung, dekat Bali tu Lampung, ya ha. Macam rumah di Lampung Dalam lukis Uh, Rilis yang ada dalam piramid okay. So, kalau kita lihat Kalau kita lihat Semua piramid-piramid ini Saya kata, orang yang meneruskan Binaan piramid-piramid ini Adalah orang yang membina ini okay. 
So, dalam satu kajian The Secret of Pyramid Kalau tuan-tuan jumpa Saya minta kawan saya, uh, student saya sebenarnya Pergi pinjamkan buku dekat Royal British Library Mengenai Secret of Pyramid Pyramid ini Dua part tiga Dekat sini ni ada satu space bagi sacred space Kalau dia letakkan uh, benih Benih akan cepat tumbuh Letakkan pisau tajam selagi Letakkan buah ataupun daging yang lambat masuk So, mengapa begitu special ruang di sini? Saya dengan kawan-kawan saya di Fakulti Mizur Tuhan cuba mencari Kan, kami belum jumpa jawapannya lagi Sebenarnya, ruang sacred space ini juga ada di pada, dekat sini Dekat sini, dan dekat sini Dan dekat sini Ya, yeah? kalau kamu perhatikan ke masjid bina bina lama ni semuanya ada ada ruang. Dan kalau kita potong piramid ni potong dekat sini, sebenarnya sama dengan yang macam ni. Dengan yang ni, dengan yang ni. Ya, yeah? sini adalah sacred space. Pokoknya sini pun adalah sacred space. Ya, yeah? nah, ini satu teori yang mungkin ada yang kurang setuju dengan saya. Tapi inilah yang saya jumpa setakat ini Hanya peradaban orang Melayu cukup lama Kalau kita lihat Orang Melayu masih meneruskan dengan binaan piramid Bungkus nasi lemak, tudung saji, tiara, berbang dan sebagainya Ya? Okey So, apa yang saya nak katakan bahawa Peradaban orang Melayu sudah lama dan kalau tuan-tuan cuba untuk membina bandar kepada orang Melayu Seberadaban dan sejarah orang Melayu cukup lama Yang perlu dipertimbangkan Ya So, kalau kita lihat Siapa itu orang Melayu Mungkin ada ada yang tidak setuju Ya eh? Tapi tak apa, sebenarnya sudah lama ada dalam perbagaan Malaysia Sudah dituliskan dan diwar-warkan Semenjak Uh, tahun 1997 21 Ogos 1997 Orang Melayu mesti Bergama Islam Ada satu lagi bahasa hanya, Saya rasa hanya orang Melayu Dan satu bangsa lagi Yang meletakkan syarat agama untuk menjadi bangsa yeah. Apa kak? Siapa lagi satu bangsa itu? Nah jadi bangsa itu Mesti agama itu Jews Jews eh? Nak jadi orang Yahudi mesti ber, ber, beragama Jews yeah? So begitu juga orang Melayu Nak jadi orang Melayu mesti beragama Islam Syarat dia eh? Dia mesti mengamalkan adat budaya Melayu Berbahasa Melayu Dan keturunan orang Melayu yeah? Saya nak tanya tuan-tuan Ridwanti orang kampung saya Kenal ya eh? Ridwanti yang pula? Dia orang kampung saya Memang asalnya dia orang, dia orang Cina lah ya? Tapi dia beragama Islam Dia belajar agama Islam Sekecil dan sekolah rendah lagi Kemudian dia uh, Berhijrah kepada Islam Dia kahwin dengan orang Islam Dia mengamalkan budaya Islam Boleh tak kita panggil dia Melayu? Ikut perlombagaan? Tak boleh Sebab Tak ada keturunan Tak ada keturunan Ya eh? Okay, kita lihat lagi So, kalau kita lihat Sundaland, ini adalah Satu Tanah yang besar dulu ya, sebelum ditenggelamkan Oleh banjir, 14,000 tahun 12,000 tahun, 8,000 tahun Ya, jadi Sebenarnya, orang Melayu juga Sudah dikenali sebagai mother of all races Sudah diterap Kerana DNA-nya, salsilah DNA Sampai 200,000 tahun Salah silah DNA orang Melayu sampai 200 ribu tahun Dan orang Melayu sudah dikira sebagai mother of all races Kalau orang Melayu mother of all races So, di dua antri tadi Cucu pada orang Melayu yeah. So, maknanya orang Melayu sudah lama membangunkan pemikiran dan pasak kehidupan mereka Kalau kita nak membangunkan bandar untuk mereka Harap dapat consider benda-benda ini yeah. So Agaknya bahasa orang Melayu bahasa apa? 
Kalau orang Cina bahasa dia Mandarin, orang India bahasa dia Tamil. Orang Arab bahasa dia Arab. Orang Melayu bahasa dia apa? Itu bangsa. Bangsa Melayu bahasanya apa? Tak tahu ya. Okey, kalau kita lihat bahasa Sanskrit, agaknya siapa pemilik bahasa Sanskrit selama ni? Orang India, itu orang putih kata ya. Orang putih kata bahasa Sanskrit adalah bahasa orang India. Tapi kita tengok kata ni, 100% proof Rig Veda is not Hindu scriptures and Sanskrit is not Hindu language. Ya? Kat sini tu lah. Uh, orang India sebenarnya dia tidak mengakui bahawa bahasa Sanskrit adalah bahasa dia. Kalau orang India sudah tidak mengakui bahasa Sanskrit adalah bahasa dia sebab bahasa dia bahasa Tamil, dia lebih flow dengan bahasa Tamil dia. So bahasa Sanskrit sekarang ini tak ada pemilik sebab dulu dikatakan orang India memiliki bahasa Sanskrit. Ya? Yeah? Okey. Kita dah lagi. Orang Melayu dikatakan meminjam sebanyak 70% Bahasa Sanskrit Yang lebihnya Sama dengan yang digunakan oleh orang Arab Orang Parsi, Manbid dan Tamil Ini yang saya cakap tadi Orang Parsi dia faham Ada 3-4 ratus patah perkataan Bahasa Sanskrit dalam bahasa mereka Dan orang Arab ada 1,600 patah perkataan Sanskrit dalam bahasa mereka yeah? So Saya kata Saya kata Kalau orang Melayu menggunakan 70% Bahasa Sanskrit Boleh tak kita katakan bahawa orang Melayu adalah pemilik bahasa Sanskrit Saya sedang bercakap bahasa Sanskrit dengan tuan-tuan yeah? Adakah saya katakan meminjam bahasa Sanskrit Nak pinjam dari siapa? Mengapa ini penting? Tersangat penting sebenarnya yeah? Tersangat penting Kalau kita tak tahu siapa pemilik bahasa Sanskrit Okay. Di India Ada lebih kurang 400-500 orang sahaja Yang boleh menuturkan bahasa Sanskrit Itu pun untuk guna mantra Doa Sami-sami itu doa menggunakan bahasa Sanskrit Macam kita lah nak doa menggunakan bahasa Arab yeah? Tapi kita tahu dia tak faham pun yeah? So tapi Di alam Melayu ini Ada lebih 400 juta orang Sedang bercakap menggunakan bahasa Sanskrit dan bahasa Sanskrit juga masih menjadi bahasa ilmu yang terus diperjuangkan oleh saya mudah-mudahan dan UKM UKM masih juga memperjuangkan penggunaan bahasa Sanskrit dan telah menjadikan sebagai bahasa ilmu itu sebab saya memilih untuk bercakap bahasa Sanskrit hari ini bahasa Sanskrit dia apa? eh? Oleh sebab orang Melayu adalah ibu segala bangsa Maka dicadangkan bahawa Bahasa Arab, Parsi, Tamil, Hindi, Mandarin Sebagainya adalah pinjaman dari bahasa orang Melayu Iaitu Sanskrit Dan bukannya sebaliknya Eh? Okey? Kita berbeza terawal dikatakan berbahasa Sanskrit Kitab Veda berbahasa Sanskrit eh? Apa itu Kitab Veda? Pernah dengar Zakir Naik eh? Zakir Naik Dia sudah mengkaji kandungan Kitab Veda Dia kata Kitab Veda adalah Kitab Tauhid eh? Maka apa agama orang Melayu terdahulu? Kita sekarang ini kita nak bercakap pasal seni bina Bandar Raya Islam tapi apa agama orang Melayu terdahulu Adakah temadun orang Melayu ni selepas eh, Kehidupan Nabi Muhammad Ataupun sebelum itu orang Melayu beragama apa Apa nak berapa apa ya Dulu orang Melayu <laughs> Apa agak ni Ada idea tak Ada idea tak Orang Melayu dulu agama apa Orang putih kata apa? Orang Melayu agama apa? Dia kata orang Melayu dulu beragama Hindu, Buddha ya? Saya pernah tegur Ustaz Ustaz Sekarang ni Ustaz mau fitnah Dan mengkafirkan Datuk Nenek kita Tak 
apa kita ucap beri saya betul ke? Orang, orang Melayu kita dulu beragama Hindu Buddha. Ya? Yeah? Cuba lihat dulu ayat ini. Dalam Al-Quran, Rahim Rahim. Taklah mengatakan penuh Dan kami tidak utuskan seorang rasul Melainkan dengan bahasa kaumnya Supaya ia menjelaskan hukum-hukum Allah Kepada mereka Maka Allah menyesatkan siapa yang dikenakinya Okey, maknanya Allah Ta'ala mengutuskan rasul Supaya, supaya boleh cakap dengan bahasa kaumnya Kalau kita beda Ditulis dalam bahasa Sanskrit Maka untuk sampul kitab itu Ya, yeah? maka ada masa saya pijen dekat masjid negara itu ada imam besar masjid masjid putra uh, jaya dia kata dok agaknya siapa nak pergi Melayu <laughs> mungkin tak lah bagi clue yang ini lah sebab dalam surah Ibrahim eh? mungkin kita kena cari lah maknanya ni para pengkaji ni kena cari lah yeah? so Adakah pernah kita terlihat kat mana-mana statue yang disembah oleh orang Melayu? Pernah jumpa tak di mana-mana? Saya pernah berjumpa tanya, selalu berbincang dengan para arkeologis di UKM. Malah saya tanya saya dengan Profesor yang mengatakan saya Dato' uh, Nek Hassan Suhaimi. Dato' dah lama buat arkeologi, pernah tak jumpa statue yang orang Melayu sembah? So, agaknya ada tak? Agaknya ada tak Cerita orang Melayu sembah Tak ada Kalau tak ada Maknanya orang Melayu bukan Orang Hindu dan Buddha Ya yeah? So maka agama apa yeah? So sebenarnya saya cuba nak menafikan Sebab nanti Para pengkaji nak design ni Nanti orang confuse ya Bila kita clearkan di sini Orang Melayu bukan agama Hindu Buddha Ada kitabnya dan ada rasulnya Ya, yeah? So kalau kita lihat Sebenarnya Hinduism datang kemudian Asalnya Vedaism Ya yeah? Di India itu Kemudian 1500 tahun Tunggu Kasta Brahma Dia dah memperakperandakan Ajaran Vedaism Maka lahirlah Hinduism, Buddhism dan Jainism Di India Lewat sebenarnya Masa, masa ini juga lah Lahirnya Sigarta Gautama Ya yeah? Okey so Uh, itu satu hal lagi Yang kena saya cepatkan Kalau kita lihat orang di Bali Agaknya menyembah apa ya Tuan-tuan pernah pergi ke Bali ya Pernah tengok candi orang Bali Ada tak statue di dalam candi orang Bali Tak ada Saya pernah tanya Bapak, bapak agama apa Hindu Bapak enggak ada itu patungnya Bisa ada patung So bapak agama <laughs> Dia tak bagi So bapak sembah apa ya Agaknya siapa yang dia semua? Sang Yang Wili Sang Yang Wili Siapa faham Sang Yang Wili ni ada orang Jawa ni? Mana orang Jawa ni? Tuan, apa agaknya Sang Yang Wili? Yang Maha Esa eh? Orang ni balik menyembah Yang Maha Esa So, saya tanya Bapa, kitabnya apa? Kitabnya Weda Weda datang dari mana? Yang diturunkan oleh Wili Weda dan Wili Ya Make sense ya ha, Tapi kena ada kajian lagi ya? Cuma mungkin orang di Bali itu sudah mengamalkan syarat yang tidak betul Kalau kita lihat sejarah Mereka ini adalah daripada Jawa Tengah Di mana adanya benda-benda ini dulu Ya di Jawa Tengah So semasa kerajaan Islam Demak semakin kuat Mereka tidak mahu menukar syarat Maka mereka lari ke Bali So ini ada cerita orang Bali Dia orang di Bali juga sebenarnya Dia tidak Cuma orang sekarang saja yang meletakkan statue Itu pun statue yang tak ada kaitan dengan Penyembahan sebenarnya ya, Statue yang ada di klinik-klinik ini Adalah Sebagai amanat Mesej Penceritaan sebenarnya ya. okay. Kalau kita lihat Orang Melayu sudah mengamalkan Ajaran Tauhid sudah lama sangat Sudah lama sangat Kalau tuan-tuan lihat dalam uh, First Encyclop- uh, Islam Encyclop- Encyclopedia Ada dinyatakan situ Ada satu kumpulan nama dia Sayabiga 
Mereka adalah si fairness, mereka adalah pejuang Yang memperjuangkan agama Allah Ta'ala sebelum Islam lagi Mereka menduduki tempat di Teluk Parsi dan di Yaman Bila saya tanya ustaz-ustaz, ustaz agaknya orang Arab ni belajar menulis Al-Quran Siapa yang ajar mereka? Siapa yang mengajar orang Arab menulis Al-Quran? Eh? Rupanya ada hadis Seolah kata yang mengajar orang Arab menulis adalah Ahlul Yaman Ahlul Yaman ni adalah orang yang tinggal di sekitar Yaman dan Teluk Parsi eh? ha, So ahli sejarah memanggil mereka sebagai saya juga dan kena carilah siapa itu saya bega Sebab orang Melayu sudah uh, apa? Mentahankan Allah sejak sekian lama Maka itu kena kita kena pegang Sebab budi dan daya orang Melayu Yang panggil budaya itu Budi adalah satu intrinsik Daya adalah yang intrinsik Yang luar okay? So adalah berasaskan kepada Tauhid ada budi dan daya Budaya orang Melayu Sebenarnya diasaskan kepada Tauhid Sudah lama Diasaskan kepada Tauhid Itu sebab rumah dia Terus menghadap ke Qiblat Daripada dulu Cuma sekarang orang Melayu sudah tidak membina rumah menghadap ke Qiblat eh? Kalau kita lihat Ini tuan-tuan ada tengok ya eh? Qiblat orang Melayu eh, Qiblat orang Islam yang ada di tanah Melayu ini adalah 290 darjah daripada utara agaknya menghadap ke mana 290 darjah adalah menghadap ke Multazam 290 darjah daripada utara adalah menghadap ke Multazam Hajar Aswad tempat yang paling mustajab doa Subhanallah orang yang menghadap ke Multazam adalah orang di tanah Melayu Eh, dan Sri Lanka Nah yang lain itu yang gede lain-lain eh? Adakah ini berbetulan Ataupun kebetulan Berbetulan Ataupun kebetulan Tuan-tuan. Saya kata ini berbetulan Memang dalam perancangan Allah Memakar pemakar Allah Perancangan Allah tersangat tepat yeah? So istimewanya Orang yang ada di Tanah yang dijanjikan ini Eh So, para pengkaji Mungkin kena lihat balik yang ini Semua piramid tadi Kalau tuan-tuan lihat Menghadap ke Qiblat eh? Menghadap ke Qiblat So, maknanya kita kena Ubah kita punya talaan Orientation kita Mengarah ke situ Ada satu force yang cukup istimewa Ke arah itu eh? So, jadi Kita lihat Balik Bina-bina orang Melayu itu dahulu belajar mengenainya ya? okay? So, si Paul Pernheimer mengatakan peradaban orang Melayu Bermula 6,000 tahun dulu Tapi tak ada pun dalam eskalopedia di mana-mana Tidak ada nyatakan, mengapa? Mengapa mereka tak ada siapa pun nak ceritakan? Ya? So, namun saya kata sebab ada kita 10,000 tahun dulu Orang Melayu sudah membina piramid yang cukup hebat Maknanya peradaban dia mungkin lebih 10,000 tahun Kalau kita lihat Ini di Borobudur ya, kapal Kapal orang Melayu ini sangat besar Lihat tulisan Comparus Lihat tulisan I Ching Lihat tulisan uh, Claudius Ptolemy ya? Rumah orang Melayu ini juga Tersangat hebat sebenarnya ya? Tak ada satu, tak ada orang pun Tentu bangsa pun yang membuat rumah untuk dibuka semula Buat rumah Duduk dibuka semula Pindahkan Sama balik Tak ada Ada lah Pasal pak dia Ya So kata makanan Saya kata saya tak jumpa Makanan dengan tempat lain Yang bagus-bagus Ya Ini Kalau orang yang sudah Berjaya mencipta makanan Maknanya dia orang yang menang Sebenarnya Hanya orang menang Sahaja yang mampu Untuk mereka cipta Bahan makanan yang sedap Orang yang hidup susah Mana nak mampu Mencipta makanan sedap Ya, yeah? So, kawan-kawan saya yang datang daripada US, daripada Europe Dia kata kalau ada peluang datang ke Malaysia Dia kata, dia tak lepas peluang sebab Malaysia is a food heaven Makanan yang sedap-sedap yeah? 
Makanan sedap Orang yang berjaya menghasilkan makanan sedap Adalah orang yang menang Okey Ini adalah uh, mapping saya Ini usul Melayu Tuan-tuan boleh lihat Agak kontroversi Tapi inilah yang saya telah hasilkan Boleh lihat dekat mana-mana lah okay. Okay. Saya tak nak cerita lanjutkan dia So kalau kita lihat Bila kita cakap mengenai Islam Memang agak kontroversi lah okay. Orang takut dengan Islam, dengan AS lah boleh tapi cuba lihat daripada pengertian dia segi bahasa dia ya dia daripada akar perkataan salima ya dan beberapa kata seperti aslam ataupun menundukkan atau menghadapkan salama menyerah diri salama sejahteraan atau keselamatan silim kedamaian dan sulam tangga ataupun bertahap ini sebenarnya pengertian Islam tapi ada yang viralkan perkataan Islam Jadi kita <tuk> Dah takut nak menggunakan perkataan Islam Ya yeah? okay. So kalau kita lihat Apa itu pengertian seni bina uh, Imam Isyam Al-Bakri Dia kata Seni bina adalah hasil dari pembentukan kemajuan Satu masyarakat Berdasarkan pengalaman hidup Ya yeah? Maksudnya kita jangan lupakan pengalaman hidup Bangsa yang lama tamadunnya ini ya? Rupa bentuk seni bina adalah hasil dari pengaruh cara kehidupan harian Kepercayaan, kebudayaan, sejarah dan sebagainya Cara bina dipilih pengaruh oleh keadaan alam sekeliling Kegunaan bahan bina cepatan Alam sekeliling sekali lagi ya? Orang tak rasa kita belajar apa yang dia buat Orang tak kata kalau nak mengenal dia Tengoklah apa yang dia lihat Apa yang dia buat Ya So, secara umumnya, persejarah seni bina adalah selaras dengan sejarah suatu masyarakat itu Okay, so maknanya Macam mana? Satu cabaran sebenarnya untuk membangunkan satu bandar Kepada satu bangsa yang memang sudah lama hebat Okay So, uh, Datuk Sri Dr. Mahathir kata apa? Normally for a country, its identity can be When we see the town and village in the country for the first time, there is only a special form. Ah, itu sebab dia buat satu banyak special form. Eh? So kalau kita tengok, yang menunjukkan juga dia kata, architecture not only provide an uh, easily recognizable, uh, recognizable form, but also show the country's achievement. Ya, yeah? so kita tengok, inilah antara cabaran kita sebenarnya. Kalau kita nak bangunkan. Bandar untuk orang ini So, kalau kita lihat lagi Mungkin di sekolah Dia dah diajar, cikgu-cikgu mengajar ni Tapi saya nak refresh balik yeah. So, Pak Rudolf kata apa Architecture is one of men Highest, highest achievement reflecting The culture of the time So, kalau kita lihat yeah, Culture of the time Maksudnya apa Budaya yang ikut masa eh? Budaya ada satu yang dynamic Hidup, budaya ada hidup Tradition, adakah tradition itu hidup? Tradition adalah berterusan sebenarnya Tradition adalah amalan eh? Tapi budaya ada satu yang dynamic Hidup That's why kita kata, kita tidak boleh pergi ke belakang eh? Sebab budaya adalah satu yang hidup ke depan Kadang tu kita bercakap pasal progresif Tapi bila cakap pasal arkitektur City planning Kita pergi ke regress Pergi ke belakang Itu salah kita sebenarnya okay? Kita tidak melihat juga Sesuai dengan budaya yang Sentiasa progress ke depan okay? Kita lihat Sebenarnya dikaitkan dengan Kemajuan budaya okay? Kita cuba tengok ni. Budaya orang Melayu berpakaian okay? Ini orang Melayu dulu Okay dia ya, maju sikit, maju sikit Ini yang sekarang Agaknya Kalau kita nak buat Atasnya sekarang Umpamanya Anak dara Tiga orang ni Nak ke dia pakai baju macam yang sini Nak ke tak Mesti dah tak nak kan Nampak aku macam ni Begitu juga atasnya Kita nampak satu atasnya Zaman sekarang Tapi kita pakaikan baju Entah mana-mana Zaman dulu tak tahu Bila 
Itu tak kena lah eh? Itu yang uh, Dr. Taj kata The spirit of time, spirit of place ke yeah? Kena tengok balik So ini juga kontroversi dalam pementangan saya Selalu Tak ada orang marah So kalau kita lihat Apa istimewanya bangunan ini eh, Kalau di Spain tu Gaudi dah buat Kalau dekat perambanan tu orang di Orang Jepun dekat perambanan tu dah buat Ya, kalau kita nak cakap pasal style, karakter dia tak ada apa pun benda ni Ya, ha, mungkin teknologi dia lagi bagus lah ya. So, kita tengok Vitruvius kata apa Vitruvius kata The architecture, the arrangement of building should be guided by locality and climate Kena kan tadi dengan ayat pertama yang saya sebutkan tadi Locality and climate, kita jangan lupa yang itu Setiap tempat Allah Ta'ala jadikan dia iklim dia berbeza-beza Sekitaran dia berbeza-beza Dan kita kena ingat yang itu eh? So saya agak heran mengapa orang di Malaysia buat bangunan nampak macam ada di sini nah, Ini yang terbaru eh? So Ini kalau kita lebih datang dia hidup lagi tengok Dia gelakkan kita eh? Apa lah korang ni Aku buat bangunan ni lama dulu dah Tapi korang apa dah buat Kemudian sekarang nampak macam yang aku buat dah dulu Okay Okay Ini juga orang marah dekat saya Sekolah pasal kata Architecture is something that related to culture For those building do not prefer into culture It's not because it's architecture It's just merely a building Okay So, saya pun kadang nak malu Agaknya membawa kawan-kawan saya Untuk melawat putra jaya Sebab dia tanya balik, apa pasal bangunan Perdana Mata Impon ni nampak macam kubur yang dekat India So, apa, apa agaknya kita nak nyawa? <laughs> so, kat mana maruah, maruah Perdana Mata kita kan? Buat bangunan nampak macam kubur Eh, salah satu hal lah kita ni kan? Atau buat apa? Mungkin yang ni sebab dia terlalu nak melihat objek sentet sangat ni <laughs> Lihat objek sentet rupa, yang dia tengok tu adalah kubur rupanya yeah? Okay. So, saya tu tanya student saya Agaknya, kalau itu kan Sekolah Kostok ni kata, antara bangunan ini Dan bangunan ini, mana yang lebih layak Dipanggil lagi tak macam <laughs> <Yeah? laughs> Student saya dah pandai, dia kata Pondok ni layak dipanggil lagi tak macam yeah? Compare dengan bangunan yang Agak, yang agak ni, cukup hebat yeah? <coughs> So, saya dah lajukan je lah Saya rasa saya dah Tentukan masa ni ya. Lama sangat Saya pun tak nak yang ni uh, Nanti lihat sajalah Ok Ini tadi Sebenarnya dalam seni bina Sebenarnya Islam Ok Kalau kita lihat Ajaran Islam juga Dia mengandungi suruhan dan larangan ya, Suruhan dan larangan Jadi Saya nak tanya kawan saya, arkitek Ini arkitek dia ni lah Apa pasal kau buat bangunan dekat Masjid ni masjid eh Masjid dekat eh, Kuala Lanas Kan? Macam mana masjid kau ni ada lima menara kan? Kalau satu menara kan sini dia okey lah Tapi Tadi Prof Mawi kata Kalau satu menara pun Kalau boleh sepodeng orang Tak boleh tak islami juga kan <laughs> Ini Satu majlis kecil ada lima menara Eh? Oh hebat lah majlis tu Tuan, kawan ni kata apa? Alah masuk, oh, inilah this is metronis problem Dia nak macam tu, aku buat je lah eh? So dia tak hebat pula kan? Bagi cakap kau saya, kau tak hebat je Ini dia, duit masyarakat ni, duit rakyat ni Dia, dia balik nak jawab dia lah eh? So, satu hal so, kawan saya, uh, student saya daripada Iran Dia kata, sir Dia kata, you been to Iran You find the, the mosque with only one minari Dia kata, kau jangan pergi yang ada dua menara uh, Yang satu menara tu sunni kata, Yang dua menara tu ada sunni Jadi, ok Maksudnya, Kalau saya pergi sana, saya tahu lah nak pilih Bijik yang mana yeah, Mana itu ada simbol lah Kawannya kita tahu eh? uh, Tapi yang lima ni, saya tak faham <laughs> <laughs> Saya tak faham Okey, uh, kalau kita lihat 
ya kita lihatlah bagaimana orang Melayu dulu dia cuba eh, menggunakan kiasan dalam berpakaian kalau salah kata Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam berkata seorang lelaki akan kelihatan hebat segar kalau dia memakai amama apa agaknya amama amama adalah kain yang dililitkan atas kepala kain yang dililitkan atas kepala ya okey so maka ramailah orang yang cuba Uh, dia translate amamah itu ha? macam orang Yaman, macam ni orang India, macam ni orang Iran, macam ni orang di Turki, macam ni orang di Pakistan, macam ni. Saya so, kan lain-lain kan. Macam ber, mereka melilitkan uh, amamah dengan cara yang berbeza-beza. Tapi agaknya untuk kita uh, yang balik bawa balik dari Mekah ni dia pilih yang mana? Dia tak ada kat sini kan? Yang balik dari Mekah ni dia tak pakai macam ni lah. Dia pakai yang macam ni. Yang <laughs> boleh dia buka. Eh. Ini, ini dekat dekat Thailand. Ini dekat China. Yeah. So, saya lihat. Mengapa Asaud ni, dia tidak memakai amama. Dia tak nampakkan hadis Nabi. Dia tak jumpa pun hadis Nabi. Dia tak pakai amama. Dia pakai apa ni nama dia? Kain yang letak atas kepala ni macam mana? Saya tengok macam Reba Yahudi pula Dia pakai letakkan kain atas kepala ni So kalau kita kata Pakcik-pakcik kita balik muka ni Macam orang Yahudi lah dia suruh makan Kan tapi ni lah hakikat dia ya? So rupanya asap ni adalah keturunan pada Yahudi ya? So itu sebab macam-macam hal berlaku dekat Tanah Mekah tu eh Data Islami dia lagi yarik lah Dengan pembangunan di Mekah tu eh? So, orang Melayu Sudah menzahirkan Amamah dengan cara yang begini Ini Amamah juga Ini nama dia, eh? yang saya pakai ni juga Amamah Terus Segak eh? Automatik, saya pakai je Alamak terus segak Dan hadis nabi ada lah betul Empat eh? <laughs> So, saya memakai Saya memakai Sunnah juga ni eh? Rasulullah suruh Okay. Terus orang suruh pakai amamah Tapi kita lihat Para penggaji cuba lihat bagaimana Orang Melayu mengkiaskan amamah itu Dalam bentuk yang begini yeah. So kebanyakan kita uh, Orang kita tengok kalau saya pergi Kat masjid tadi pun Ramainya yang macam ini Macam ini atau yang macam ini Ini yang mereka lihat yeah. okay. So dalam masjid tadi saya rasa saya seorang yang pakai mamah yang macam ni Heran ni saya Aneh Wah heran ni mamah dari mana ni Nak berlakon film ke apa ni <laughs> eh? ha, Memang jadi perhatian saya tadi dekat masjid eh? Sebab so, saya mamah saya agak berbeza dengan mamah yang orang biasa eh? Okey So inilah sebenarnya lepas ini, ini yang penting Saya rasa masa pun dah, dah habis buat ya Sebenarnya ini saya cuba untuk berkongsi untuk berkongsi apa yang dah berlaku Kalau kita lihat Saya kata Sebenarnya untuk nampak Desain arkitektur Ambil saja karakter ni Dan umumnya ya, Dr. Tash, saya ingat lagi Dr. Tash Dia kata Orang orang sekarang ni dia ambil mudah Dia ambil rumah Melayu ni, dia ambil bahasa pump Dia pump, 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 pump Dia besar ya, ini, ini yang berlaku ni Bagi apa? Prof. Belon lagi tak je <laughs> Bukan bagi film yang kita cek yang ada dekat Dekat, dekat Europe Bukan dekat US tu Dekat sini mana belum ha, ya, Sama juga yang ni oh, Saya kata Okey juga kalau nak buat ni Akan revival dia jumpa pros Tapi konteks dia tak kena Dan ha, ini kalau nak kelantan-kelantan tu Kita boleh kata pejabat mata sikit lah Boleh accept eh? ha, Tapi ini saya tak faham Mengapa selama 500 tahun Kerajaan Semana memerintah Turki Buat masjid macam bagian sosial Itu saya tak faham Saya tak faham mengapa Kerajaan Rosman ya Selama 500 tahun pemerintah Turki Membina masjid Mampak macam bagian sosial Kemudian orang di KL pun nak tiru juga Itu lagi saya tak faham eh? So itulah yang dikatakan krisis eh? Saya ingat lagi buku saya saya buat satu manuskrip buku saya eh? uh, Crisis of Architectural Profession in Malaysia Tahun 2000 
Doktor tak sebegitu Lepas tu ni macam ni ke praktis sekarang Dan Betul macam ni lah Tuan Dui pun saya buat ya. Lepas tu Doktor tak cuba bantu saya untuk publish Rata-rata Nak publish kan Tapi nak ada siapa nak berani publish Termasuk pula bila translate ke English Pen pun tak nak nak publish Okay. Tapi yang dalam ni lah DBP setuju nak publish 2010 Maknanya selepas 10 tahun Saya sediakan manuskrip Dukrasi sebab Hakta Pencara Profesia di Malaysia Baru DBP setuju nak publish Itu pun uh, 2013 baru keluar Dan 13 tahun <laughs> Manuskrip itu baru dia dihasilkan ya. So macam-macam cerita lah Ini tuan-tuan boleh dapat lah Dekat DBP buku Dukrasi sebab Hakta Pencara Profesia di Malaysia Ya So uh, memang agak menyentuh uh, kritikan saya itu yang berdasarkan saya buat berdasarkan pengalaman saya sendiri lah. Ya. So ini juga satu yang agak mengherankan uh, di Kelantan bila dah jemu nak buat majid pakai kubah ni, tu nampak lah buat lah majid nampak macam ni. Kan jadi orang Orang Cina yang ada dekat Kelantan tu dah sebut salah lah Kalau orang Melayu buat majlis nampak macam topong Dia nampak topong nampak macam apa? <laughs> Kerajaan apa? MBKB kata Buat bangunan kat ada kubah Kalau marah dia Dia tak nak Dia tak nak buat topong dia Ada kubah okay? So Sukar Susah lah masalah Kalau kita letakkan uh, Image macam ni Kepada satu binaan yang tak sepatutnya sebenarnya ya. So, uh, ni Dr. Taj selalu sebut ya, kebanyakan kita bila bercakap pasal Islam, kita merujuk kepada apa yang ada di Timur Tengah, Asia Tengah dan bentuknya tersebut. Ya. Inilah juga yang telah menjadi uh, saya punya kajian ya dalam PhD saya so sebenarnya kita lupa yang ini saya banyak kali saya ramai klien yang nak buat masjid ya, master kata masjid tak ada kubah ni nampak macam bukan masjid so saya tanya balik kalau bangunan-bangunan macam ni nak panggil apa kalau bukan masjid ya, so kita fikirkan balik bentuk-bentuk ya, yang memang sudah sinonim dengan Malayu Eh, Malai Ur tadi okay, Saya nak cepatkan yang ni Saya nak cepatkan yang ni lah Kita dah tak ada masa Nanti baca je lah ya Itu di sana Masalah Ini satu hal kalau kita nak melihat lambang ya, Ini permasalahan besar sebenarnya e, Dekat masjid ada lambang bintang lima kan So kalau kita lihat black metal pun pakai bintang lima kan? Ini orang Zionis pun pakai bintang lima juga So mengapa kita tak sinonim dengan lambang-lambang mereka Ini satu persoalan lagi ya. Ha, ini so, banyak bintang-bintang Yang ini pun Yang ini Haa uh, Dr. Ismawi mungkin boleh explain lah kot nanti Mengapa orang ni harap ada lambang ini pula eh So uh, Ini semua tak nak cerita Nanti boleh baca sendiri Ya yeah.
Dia berbeza-beza. Kita keterima hakikat itu. Inilah yang panggil identiti. Eh? So, kalau hadis juga, banyak hadis-hadis tadi, Dr. Taj sudah uh, kongsikan banyak hadis yang kita boleh tengok balik, ya, yang kita boleh garap idea dia apa boleh kita untuk uh, menzahirkan kita punya bandar dan sebuah kita bersiap uh, kalau kita lihat seni bina seni bina dikatakan ibu atau raja kepada ilmu kesenian ya So, memang terbanyakkan uh, mengandungi banyak ilmu-ilmu yang ada dekat situ. Ya? So, mana boleh maknanya kalau Petron. Saya suka statement daripada Frank Gehry. Dia kata, sometimes I don't understand to the client. The English to the architect. But at the same time, they're giving instruction to the architect. Faham tak? Kan, mereka English architect banyak fee kepada architect. Tapi at the same time, mereka yang bagi instruction kepada architect. So, inilah masalah yang sedang berlaku kepada kita di luar eh, maksud saya lah saya pernah kena terminik sebab saya tak nak ikut cakap klien ada juga eh. so, ini adalah antara cabaran praktisional di luar eh. so, pengertian seni bina dan persejarahan seni bina so, kita lihat balik setiap bangsa tadi, kita panjang masa kita sebenarnya Melaku, melakarkan sejarah Kita consider lah Sejarah yang dibangunkan oleh masyarakat Yang kita nak kita Yang jadi objek Individu kepada uh, Perancangan kita yeah? So Dalam kajian saya Untuk uh, Terhadap rumah warisan Ini yang saya kongsikan Ada saya dah kenal pasti Ada 33 prinsip Ataupun lunak seni bina rumah warisan Melayu yang kita boleh pakai sebenarnya Bila kita nak membangunkan seni bina ataupun bandar sejahtera ya, Kita pakai lah, orang Melayu sama dia, dia dah lama kan Pemikiran dia dah lama, dia dah cukup matang sebenarnya Pelajari lah daripada apa yang telah mereka bangunkan So di sekolah seni bina juga kita diajar tentang apa itu Kemanusiaan, humanity eh? Kita diajarkan juga supaya mematuhi Apa yang dikatakan Sebenarnya Spirit of place Ya, comply Ini adalah prinsip-prinsip Rule or principle dalam design Dan kita pakai balik Kita cuba balik, cuba masalah kita sekali pun Dalam uniform paling baik lho Dah lama tidak digubal-gubal Ya So uh, Kita cubalah Lihat balik prinsip-prinsip seminar yang anda belajar yang kita dah pelajari ataupun kita mengajarkan kepada student kita so, kita cuba membuka fikiran untuk menerima hakikat tentang percanggahan dan pembangunan bandar Islam yang ada sekarang jadi eh, Dr. Mawi ada menceritakan tentang kesilapan kelepan orang yang nak buat dulu jadikan ada sempadan eh? jadikan ada sempadan kita jangan ulangi, mana yang baik itu jadikan ada teladan, kita, kita boleh Belajar darinya ya? So, membuka fikiran Untuk menerima nasihat arkitek Orang Ta'ala dia ada cerita tak Dalam uh, Al-Quran Al-Nahi ayat 43 Bertanyalah kepada orang yang mengetahui Jika kamu tidak mengetahui Ini kalau faham uh, Nahu Bahasa Arab ni Bertanyalah Maksudnya ini fail amar sebenarnya Fail suruhan Kena buat Kalau tak tahu kena tanya Jangan memandai-mandai saja yeah? So ini masalah kita sekarang ni yeah? uh, Termasuklah Petron-petron uh, saya Dia mengalahkan ustaz Dia nak buat mesin, mesti nak kena buat dom Tak boleh saja yeah? So Ini satu lagi Hadis yang saya rasa Kena ambil perhatian Barang siapa yang menyerupai suatu kaum Maka ia telah menjadi sebahagian daripada mereka So Di kuatiri kalau kita nak buat Masjid nampak macam ini Nampak macam ini, cuba nampak macam ini Di kuatiri kita adalah sebahagian Daripada mereka Ya ini adalah hadis sahih ya? So Ini
ini adalah gambar arsitek. Saya ada arsitek yang tak lama lah dia pakai drawing board lagi. Sekarang tak ada dah kot eh. So biasanya kalau ni saya saya begitu kita kata apa ya? Saya amat terasa lah sebenarnya. Sebab biasanya ini memang betul. Last best idea memang selalu macam tu apa. Okay. So kita dah buat kerja untuk cuba nak invite yang terbaik kepada klien tapi selalunya tidak diterima. Eh? <coughs> Uh, so sekarang ni sebenarnya kita kena faham juga Jadi uh, Ada ditanya Ada yang bertanya tadi Tentang lambang-lambang uh, Dr. Semawi saja Tak nak jawab tadi Dia suruh usah kepada saya Tapi kau tak nak jawab Tanya pasal lambang ni Bahaya yeah? uh, Facebook saya setahun Kena kena hack Saya tak boleh pergi trip sebab saya menceritakan saya lambang Dan saya pun tak nak cerita lagi lah ha, ini, ini tadi lah Macam lambang-lambang tu ya. Sebenarnya orang Islam yang memang Daripada dulu lagi sudah mendapat serangan ya, Kita terima hakikat tu Serangan sikiran <tuh> okay. Dalam untuk menggaris Bunak sebenarnya Islam Jadi kita kena lihat lah Patut ada peranan sunnah Memahami kebudayaan dan gaya hidup semasa masyarakat yang nak kita bangunkan itu Pendekatan kewilayahan lestari dalam amalan seni bina Islam ya? Kerendah hati-hati dalam mereka bentuk seni bina Islam Ini yang value tadi yang Prof Taj dan Prof Awi sebutkan tadi ya? So, uh, ini adalah antara pendekatan yang saya cuba kongsikan ya? Dalam mendapatkan asas pemikiran seni bina Islam So uh, Ini adalah antara cadangan saya yang mungkin boleh Dikongsikan ataupun diwacanakan yeah? Berkaitan dengan al-fan hadis Kemudian bahasa kelayahan tadi yeah? So Apa lagi? Uh, Ini adalah antara cadangan-cadangan uh, saya ya. Nanti boleh baca lah Saya rasa saya tak lebih waktu ni Okey, sumbangan kajian lanjut So, diharapkan Pembahasan ini dapat memerlukan satu perbincangan yang lebih mendalam Dan memberikan satu kerangka berfikir Semudah-mudahan apa yang akan saya Yang telah saya sumbangkan ini dapat Membantu tuan-tuan untuk Cuba menggarap idea ke arah Sabun gagasan Bandar Raya Sejahtera yeah? okay. So uh, Apa lagi Satu lagi ini sebenarnya Saya cadangkan uh, Ini satu yang Amat sukar sebenarnya yeah? Sebab kita uh, Dalam di, di Malaysia ini, kita masih belum ada satu taraf hukum Untuk meletakkan kalau kita salah dalam mereka bentuk Umpamanya, kalau saya letakkan uh, tak yang salah dalam bilik air Yang licin untuk lantai Kita masih tidak meletakkan kesalahan kepada desainer tu ya Seperti tak licin ni, tendensi untuk orang slip jatuh Ada Apa kata kalau orang jatuh dia patah kaki? Agaknya untuk mana? Kalau kita buat kerja yang baik, kita akan dapat Kita akan berupa jariah, berterusan Tapi kalau kita buat salah, juga kita akan mendapat Kesalahan kan? yang berterusan juga Ya, yeah? so itu yang kita kena ingat Tapi kita setakat ini, cakap pasal bandar ke sini bila Masih belum ada satu taraf hukum yang ditentukan oleh ulama Ya, yeah? so uh, ini adalah taraf cadangan saya lah kan. Saya lah untuk uh, the next stop Islamic Architectural Development maknanya kita melihat kepada apa yang dikatakan sebagai identiti uh, kata akhir so, pembangunan bandar seni bila Islam uh, sebanyaknya berpusat kepada nilai yeah. 
Sudah so, terlalu banyak dah sebenarnya yang berputar kan pada benda Sebab itu yang senang kan Tapi sekarang ni kita cubalah lihat Sebenarnya banyak dah contoh-contoh Bangunan-bangunan yang dah di reka bentuk Dengan melihat kepada nilai itu jadi ya. Kalau kita boleh uh, belajar pada apa yang telah dibuat ya. So, begitu juga dengan satu satu falsafah Sekarang ini kita kebanyakan especially the young designer Jika bila dapat projek je dia terus nak buat dia tak faham Fahamilah falsafah yang dibangunkan oleh orang yang terdahulu Supaya kita boleh belajar kepada dia ya. So, uh, satu yang nak saya sebutkan di sini Perbandaran ataupun seni bina yang sejahtera itu sebenarnya adalah lambang kepada ketamadunan sesuatu bangsa ya? dia mesti menunjukkan ada sense of belonging maknanya oh kita bandar itu adalah milik mereka ya? janganlah kita tiru maka kita bangunkan berdasarkan kepada kesesuaian satu bangsa ini ya? so maka biarlah satu bangsa tersebut dalam membangunkan ketamadun bangsa ini ya? so saya rasa sudah Tak apalah, kita sudah habis Ini adalah, saya nak berkongsi Ini adalah contoh masjid yang saya reka bentuk Tetapi mungkin Tidak berjaya untuk dibangunkan Kerana Jaih tak mau sign Jaih, jaih tak mau nak endorse Sebab uh, Saya tidak meletakkan kubah Kepada binan ini Jadi Jaih tak nak sign Jadi saya kata, wah, saya macam tu eh So dia, dia insist on that Jadi saya pun saya diam dulu Saya dah approach dia Tiga kali dah Mesyarat dengan mereka Mereka nak juga aku buat Dan saya pula Tak nak aku buat <laughs> So dia, dia masih Serah awang-awang lagi Sebab uh, Sekarang ni Di Selangor Semua pembangunan Mesti dapat kelulusan Jais Dalam surau Dalam masjid ya. Jadi saya akhiri uh, Tangan saya dengan Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala Terima Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Terima kasih Arkitek Dr. Masto Surat Dengan the big round of applause to Arkitek Masto Dan saya juga akan bercakap bahasa Sanskrit Terima kasih sekali lagi Terima kasih banyak-banyak And uh, we really enjoy uh, the idea In fact, though uh, most of us was, uh, Both of us are Malaysians We thought that we know what uh, the, the roots, eh, the roots of our generation. But from today's uh, explanation by Architect Master, it is an evidence that we have a lot more to discover, a lot more to dig up. And uh, on Islam, science, and civilization, uh, the study of Islamic civilization and how it has contributed to the development of human. Um, Civilization in general has been quite the major center of our concentration. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I'm also pleased because my ex student, uh, Arina, she called me about two weeks ago frantically, Bro, can you come? I said, Of course, I will come. <laughs> I mean, a student called you to talk about something that. Uh, so I will not be very technical, I will be more historical and uh, perhaps a little bit philosophical uh, and I will not take too much time and I'm glad that we have a mixed of uh, audience today so uh, to begin with I have a few slides to show more of historical interest that somehow would spark or plant something in your mind because I cannot give you the solution I can only give you some indication and something that you may want to consider in your present work or your future work Whatever your proclivities uh, your proclivities or your interest or your um, whatever that might strike your interest in your own building conception. So I like to begin with a simple question. So somebody will, will help me. Not this slide yet, later on. Okay? <laughs> From the philosophical question uh, or philosophical inquiry. Is architecture built environment, or what you might call, uh, is it a, an art or a science? Can somebody answer my question? Is it an art or a science? Both? Both? 
Unfortunately, if we were to follow the philosophical classification of art and sciences, it doesn't fall in either. Neither. But architecture and built environment as it developed in the history of learning, it became both. Because science, well art, art, you look at the definition of art, and you know, I know architects, they like their buildings to be beautiful, an extension of their ego, <laughs> or the summation of their learning and experiences of, you know, drawing from, uh, from their tours and travels all over the world. But you have to look at the definition itself, and this is why Aristotle in the past classified sciences, and that is why Muslim scholars in the past classified sciences. And when you want to put the rules of building, where do you put them? From the Islamic point of view, it falls under fiqh, it falls under jurisprudence. So your question, sir, kita ada tak hukum, do we have a rule? It was there, long time ago. And I'll tell, talk to you, I shall talk to you about a book that I'm editing now. It is an art to begin with because it is a manifestation of a talent. And this is why sometimes, for those of you who are in your final year project, if it doesn't, you know, show a little bit of artistic, isn't it? The philosophy behind it doesn't work. I'm sure for the youngsters here, you are familiar with the name Mat Lutfi, the, the YouTube sensation. I met him in Australia in Perth, and he's now sort of a, an informal student of mine. He wanted to study philosophy. You say, Prof, architecture is so dead boring. I need content. He said, he, he, he failed his final project. He had to redo it because there are more experienced architects out there coming to get master's degree in architecture. It shows that architect or architecture is an art in itself. So, a talent in expression, talent itself. So for those of you in the School of Architecture or Built Environment, you must have a little bit of talent. Talent is an expression of hidden ability, made to manifest, driven by what feels right, what feels good, what is, what is called deeply in your emotion, from the deep recesses of one's heart, in the conceiving, in the imagining. That's why architects, I know, they spend a lot of time sitting outside, maybe counting sheep. Thinking, you know, they say thinking. Something that my wife used to let, uh, let me be now. She doesn't bother me when I sit outside in the veranda, quietly. I'll do that at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, until 5 o'clock. It's a daily affair for me now. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and sit there until 5. Just stare at the blank, dark sky and stars. Because you need this. I'm sure your teachers in architecture would encourage you to do this. Do a little bit of imagining. What does it do? Well, when you imagine, you imagine full of shapes and colors. Shapes and colors has nothing to do with science. Where science is an articulation of an aspect of nature expressed in a language of science, couched very heavily in mathematical formulas. Do you architect write in formulas? You don't. You don't, isn't it? It would be quite more interesting if you do know that modern architects do really know about mathematical formulas now. Because they're dealing with modern material. The strength of a beam. You leave that to civil engineers. And that's where you get into problem with engineers. But if you're a good architect, you do know the material itself, what you understand as material science. Now, why am I speaking like this? Well, my background is in physics and astronomy. I was part of a member called the Physics Club in the in University of Wisconsin Medicine. So, the bunch of group of people that you see of BBT, Big Bang Theory, that was the group that I was in. One, one fellow was from AMEP. Additional Math, Engineering, and Physics. One fellow was from Pure Theoretical Physics. 
the other lady who, was, who came and joined our group was 13 year old Catherine Haas. She graduated from Harvard at the age of 20 with a PhD in advanced mathematics. She graduated from University of Wisconsin at the age of like, I think 15 or 16. She was very far ahead of us. Now this, these things that we must know. Science is an articulation of aspects of nature. Expressed in the language of science, couched heavily in mathematical formula, devoid of beauty, devoid of any beautification of artistic expression in confined spaces called buildings and the expanse of nature called gardens. That's why civil engineers, they don't care really, they just calculate. You know about bridge, they can calculate the, put the load and what have you. Very fascinating. To be sure, all architects would like to be thought of an artist. An artist of on ground and above ground built environment, regardless of its spatial aerial dimensions. Because now you build up. You don't build on ground anymore. The Burj is a testimony of that. It's a serious consideration of material science. You cannot just draw things but you must know the strength of material that you're dealing with. And now people are crazy about the uh, container, houses, and what have you. There is absolutely no doubt that any work of any architect, be it colossal or tiny, will directly impact the life, the life of individuals. A mega structure, for example, <clears throat> a skyscraper, like we have here in KLCC, will not only realign and redirect immediately a whole new field of vision of the vicinity and the far reaches the extent of the eyes can reach with its commanding height. You know, you look at KLCC, it can go all the way. I used to be at the CS Tower and you know, I was surprised the expense that I can see. On the other hand, you can also command the distance. So, architecture realigns a whole vicinity, and it redirects immediately a whole new field of vision. But more importantly, the immediate natural elements, the immediate natural elements, the light, the air, the ground, the sight and the sound, and its surroundings are impacted. That is why now, in, I remember when I was in New Zealand, when you want to build a building, you have to see the shadow of the building, whether it cast over the next neighbor or not. And your, world, your building will not be allowed to be built. For the reason being, they bloody need the sunlight. <laughs> Kita, we don't need sunlight. We want to be cooked up in the air-conditioned room. Nature environment, buku buku malam. This is quite fascinating. Therefore, it will impact the whole dynamics, the whole human dynamics, natural and plants. Now, these dynamics are impacted by virtue of either it is natural or it is redesigned. Because sometimes, by, by nature, I mean, when you build, you don't want to move a tall tree that has been there for many years, right? So it's nature. So that nature, and sometimes the flow of the river, you do not want to disturb it. Architects must think of that. I remember the case of uh, the Nile River. Do you know why the Nile River has never been redirected? Because Muslims architect and the Muslim engineers like um, Banu Musa was given the responsibility, but the poor group messed it up. Messed it up because the calculation was off. Because they did not try to tame nature, they tried to live with nature. And that's why Banu Musa put up a project to the caliph at that time. Look, I can tell you when this Nile will be flooded. So they, 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 they developed something called the Nilometer. <laughs> the Nilometer, the, the height of the Nile. But it didn't work. So what he did was they had to feign madness so that you don't have to be responsible for your bad calculation. So, ingenious architects in the past do have these things, but today we don't, huh? <laughs> Sorry. Now, 
Uh, among the notable works of contemporary architects and urban planner, I'm sure, and I apologize if I'm uh, sort of trying to be a little bit an expert here, but I like this person, Donald Appleyard. I'm sure you have heard of him. Who is regarded as a humanist urban planner. As a humanist, it is his philosophy that guides him into building design, uh, uh, designing buildings and cities with a concern of community and public life taken into consideration because urban environment affects the lives of local residents, the physical characteristics of cities, and can make, and can make them a place of thriving health and happiness. I think this part is missing because many of us, when we design buildings, it is a very isolated design. It is within the acreage, isn't it? We do not think of what is the overflowing uh, effect, whether it enhances people's life or it seriously affects their happiness, like Kuala Lumpur today and Putrajaya next door. It's unbelievably, terribly <laughs> you know, upsetting to leave UPM at between 5.30 to 7. <laughs> Isn't it? The traffic outside is just unbearable. Let us pay attention to one of these day, uh, Apple Yard uh, quotations. The professional and scientific field of environment usually suppresses its meanings. Environmental professionals have not been aware of the symbolic content of the environment or of the symbolic nature of their own plans and projects. Professionals see the environment as a physical entity, a functional container, a setting for social action or programs, a pattern of land users, a sensuous experience, but seldom as a social and political symbol. I think the previous speaker talked about the symbol. Symbol is very important because every building speaks about the psyche of the place. It represents the psyche of the place. For example, when you see a palm tree, it reminds you of a calm beach effect, isn't it? What kind of building that you're building to exude some kind of psyche of that place? What a contemporary planner like David has researched and advocated isn't something new. The concept of symbol derived from a building or a built environment is seen sine qua non to any project. Look at the history of Islam. It is no accident that when we look at the genesis and development of architecture in Islam, the primus, okay, in today's Transformers language, Optimus Prime. <laughs> the primus being the mosque of the Prophet. Its impetus is coterminous with the earliest built city in Islam. There was the Masjid and there was the city of Medina. Namely Medina, that was built by the Prophet, his companions and the inhabitants of Medina. The mosque was of a humble maid. It was not really extravagant at that time. There was no beautification. <coughs> a square enclosure with walls of bricks and stone, roof of palm branches and resting upon palm trunks. Very natural. Very local. There was nothing, anything remotely artistic or extravagant in the beautification reported at all. It was function, it was function, it was function. Among the first buildings raised by the Prophet and his company was this mosque, and it is by design that such a project was taken up. The new community needed a symbol of its new environment. A new name was cast, Medina. It was transformed from Yathrib. And Medina, we know the meaning of it, is a place of deen. Medina. It's a derivative word from the word Dana. It shows that this is where religion is going to be practiced in reality. That's why it's called Medina to Nabi. The place, the city of the Prophet. Actually, literally, it's the place of the religion of the Prophet. Medina to Nabi. That's why people want to go to Medina. It is a place of deen with the arrival of the Prophet. And it is called al Munawara because it is now a radiant city, casting light over the darkness of the previous life of the inhabitants of the earlier known place called Yathrib. There was Jahiliya, Yathrib, now Medina al Munawara, because it is lit by or with the guidance of the Prophet. 
So a new dynamics of human interaction is redefined and redesigned. The mosque commands the inhabitants of the city their obligation to God and their daily duties of prayers five times a day. So now the mosque, the whole... It, Medina at that time was just a city it plagued with diseases before the coming of the Prophet. It's not a place of uh, butter, trade, selling and buying, nothing else. It was a place of feud also. There were earlier tribes that was feuding for many, many uh, decades, they were saying. When the Prophet came, everything was resolved. So there's a new dynamics of life that takes place. <coughs> the streets were of human proportion. The streets were of human proportion. Encouraging pedestrian traffic that encourages human interaction, binding the new community even stronger with every bit of assalamu alaikum as one approaches the other. Do you know why? Have you been to some of the old traditional Muslim cities like Fez, uh, cities in uh, Algeria, in Morocco, uh, Egypt, not the new, new, new city, but old cities. And you see the medieval old cities in the Europe. They're all small streets because of human interaction. It makes, that is why when you go now to the old town, of, for example, I was in Stockholm three weeks ago, four weeks ago, the old, the old city of Stockholm is more human. They don't bother with the motorized vehicle because human being walks on their... Venice, nobody wants to change it into a, a motorized city. They prefer boats and walking and a little bit of bicycle, but not much. Because the human being is the main thing in the city. Right now we build city, the first consideration is maybe roads. <laughs> this prototype mosque became the center of early Muslim activities, religious, social, political, and soon its surrounding areas became a bustling area, a Maidan, for commercial activities. And these characteristics remain even until today, if not bigger, more bustling, and not even to mention the intrusion of motor rise vehicles. And it's terrible now. Medina is no longer a nice place to visit except for the place of the Prophet, visiting the Prophet. But otherwise the traffic is now slowly becoming terrible. The next mosque to be built in Islam was the mosque in Kufa, 639. What is now known in an area called Mesopotamia, Iraq, what was before known as Mesopotamia. This was new area and because this area is more familiar with palatial building, because Mesopotamia at that time was under the rule of the, or under the influence of the Persian kings, you have later on, I'm cutting short history, uh, places like Syria, Jerusalem, and Palestine. These are places, and maybe North Africa, were under the rule and the influence of the Roman Empire. The two are familiar with ancient civilization. They have their own building style. So by the time Islam moved or extended to the part called Iraq, now you see buildings for masjid having something called colonnades and marble columns that were reused from the ancient Persian kings. Just like what the Portuguese, uh, is it the Portuguese or whatever, they built the Formosa, they used the uh, ruins of the graves of the Muslim, isn't it? The stones of the graves of the Muslim in Malacca, they use them to build the Formosa that you see now today. So for us Muslim, actually when you go to Formosa, you should weep. You should be weeping because people dug your grave and use it as a... <laughs> so to me, Formosa is not a, a symbol of culture, actually. It's a symbol of very, very terrible colonization. Anyways, as a way of life, uh, encompassing the life here in this world and the next, the mosque played a crucial role. And it is the epicenter of Muslim activity, for that matter, human activity, regardless of who lives in the Muslim city, daily. Uh, because Muslims get together in that place. Here they affirm the testimony of their belief, perform their religious obligations, and henceforth spread out to get on with their daily lives. As the Muslim expansion grew with the opening of new lands, new additions can be seen to the buildings and the architecture of this thing called mosques. For example, in Egypt, Amrul bin As built a mosque in 642 in Fustat, and you can still see the mosque today. Here a development is to be noticed. A mimbar is added, a maksura, the green wood, so new things are embellished. 
So just as the Muslims were eager to learn and adopt new ways of ministering their newly opened lands in their Futuh al so too were they in adopting and adapting new building customs and practices. Within 80 or 90 years, the architecture of the mosque grew with new features added. The minaret, the mihrab, the liwan, or colonnades became common features. All were added in view of the demands of human interaction, socializing, education, and movement. Shade spaces to accommodate new activities. The design and the concept of use of space were adopted along the custom, common custom and tradition of the new place. We can see some kind of growth and development. The Muslims were not exclusivistic, meaning they took things. Like the previous speaker raised the question, why is it the Ottoman built a mosque in line with or following, copying the Hagia Sophia? It's simple in a sense. The artists, the masons, they cannot learn new habit when you want to build something, isn't it? So they have to build it in that way, because that's the way they're familiar with. We see some kind of growth and development. The Muslims were not exclusivistic or not dismissive. The use and adoption of local materials, techniques and design are common features in the architecture of mosques in the way uh, cities of Islam develop. Now, the process of instilling adab during the prophetic era took place in this mosque. This is why I was saying why mosques were built first because that was the center of activity and the instruction of learning must take place. So Adab is instilled there. Why Adab? Because as I said, the, the roads that leads to the mosque are very of human proportion. People say, Salaam Alaikum, they meet, they know each other. See the, the locality. Yeah. They call it, because every locality, the, uh, the place, it has different environment, it has different microclimate. Please look the, the history also of the people. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Moma Zainin. Thank you very much, Dr. Sumarni Ismail. Ladies and gentlemen, another big round of applause to our family speakers this afternoon. So, we would like now to invite Dr. Associate Professor Dr. Nankula Utaberta to come forward to present souvenirs to our speakers. So please welcome Doc, architect Dr. Mastor Surat. Thank you very much and he's so handsome. And I wish each and every one of us will put on something like this. Malaysia Bolin, Melayu Gaga. Okay. All right. <laughs> and the next one, Professor Dr. Muhammad Zaini bin Othman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sumarni. So, ladies and gentlemen, to sum up our events today from the morning, in, uh, from our morning session. So, we have heard from Dr. Professor Dr. Touch. We are talking about Islam and the idea of civilization and a civilized people. So, we have learned a lot. Are we civilized enough? Are we a civilized nation? So where do we go from here? Where are we heading to? Are we ready for challenge? Are we ready for changes? So ask yourself and we should do something because there are lots of uh, things that are happening around us and definitely this is the work for each and every one of us. This is not the work of our only Prime Minister. This is not the work of anyone. This is the work of us. So let us now put our hand together and make our environment, our living environment especially, a better place for our future. And then secondly, we hear from Prof Ismawi, which is basically putting civilization into a physical planning and the idea of Islamic city planning. And uh, for him, the vision of Islamic city is actually a visualization of hope and dream. So it is something that we can still work on. So we don't still, we don't have any stopping point to say that we have done what we should be doing. So ladies and gentlemen, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay? And then we have Dr. Architect Dr. Masto. By looking at him, we have the feeling, we have the courage to basically stand strong as our community, to be whole to our identity and to make sure our 
nation is a nation that we are pride, proud of. Yeah? And then how we invite architect uh, Dr. Zaini, which is basically emphasize on what is a structure without soul, without adapt. It's something that we have been forgetting. So ladies and gentlemen, in a conclusion, this is not going to be the only seminar. There will be a few more, so I hope you can bear with us and keep uh, looking for our promotions for our new seminar. And that we thank you for your passion being here from morning until afternoon. We thank you very much and hope to see you again. Thank you very much. So, uh, coffee break is served outside, so please help yourself.